Matter Radio Network. Don't run and hide. Don't be afraid. Don't turn away any longer. The truth will set you free. And now, your host, the captain of conspiracy, the prince of paranormal. This ain't your daddy's radio network show. This is Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. All right, everybody, welcome back. Welcome back. It is Thursday. January 16th, 2014. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Welcoming everybody around the world. We are 16 days into the new year. We are live from the JP Motorsports Studios right here in Burbank, California. For KJCR and the Dark Matter Radio Network, I am your host, Jimmy Church. And you know what I do. I start off every show the same way. And that is a big salute to the proud men and women in uniform all around the world fighting the good fight for us. Without them, there is no me, there is no you, there is no us, and you can't hear me right now. Happy birthday to my all-time idol today. A.J. Foyt is 79. And if you don't know who A.J. Foyt is, (laughs) he is my idol. He's a race car driver from uh, Texas. Indianapolis 500 multi-champ. A.J. Foyt, 79 years old today. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Everything is Fade to Black. Everything is at J Church Radio. Everything is Jimmy Church. You know what to do. Go follow, go like, go and subscribe. Tonight, we will have open lines going into the third segment. I will be taking your calls during the third hour of the show. You know the call-in number. It is 325 5045. It's right there on the website, jimmychurchradio.com. All right. You can always email throughout the show. You know I read as many as I can. The producers here get the good ones into me. I will read them on the air. I'll try to respond tomorrow if you're feeling lucky. All right. You can write to me all over the website. You can do it in confidence. Go to the contact page. You can do what you need to do. And the bumper music, as always, I will always thank Doug Aldridge from White Snake for uh, providing our bumper music, and tonight is no exception. Okay, now, uh, over on the forums page, I talked about that last night, and we got some really cool submissions, and I want everybody to go over there tonight, go over to jimmychurchradio.com, go to the social forums. One of uh, the postings there is from a paranormal research group out of Texas, and they posted three different uh, Class A EVPs that they think is a possible gateway portal to time travel. Go and check that out and go listen to them. I'm going to, I did it all night last night after the show, and uh, just go and check it out. It's very, very interesting stuff. And uh, tell me what you think, all right? And, okay, so moving on. We've got a great show uh, planned uh, for tonight, and it's something I've been excited about and looking forward to for quite a long time. Um, And before we get to that, I want everybody to uh, check out the uh, near miss uh, at Heathrow Airport. There's a couple of updates on that over at artbell.com. And I mentioned yesterday, by the way, this uh, article... That was put out by uh, the official, uh, semi-official FARS news agency over in Iran about <laughs> about space aliens running the United States. Okay, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about this later, but there's a couple of updates on that as well at uh, Jimmy Church Radio. So go over and check that out. And it involves Edward Snowden, by the way, of all things. And uh, so just... Just go and check that out. I'm going to talk more about this in the third hour. I want to run on about it right now. I've, I've, I've just got to hold back and save myself. Okay, so now listen, I want to go ahead and get straight into the show. So we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, um, I'm going to go commercial free. We're going to go to the top of the hour. We are going to go commercial free, and uh, we'll take things from there. And I think you are going to find the next hour, I always promise one thing, here on this show, the best, the brightest, the most international cosmopolitan thinkers there are. 
Tonight is no exception. When we come back after the break, we are going to have Jerome Clark right here with us and with you. It's time to learn something, and I'm really excited about this. This is KJCR, Fade to Black, ArtBell.com, JimmyTurtsRadio.com, on the Dark Matter Radio Network. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Dark Matter Radio Network. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three-letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S.com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. All right, welcome back. KJCR, JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I am so excited. (laughs) Uh, So let's just get straight to it. Jerome Clark has served as a writer, reporter, and editor for a number of UFO magazines and other paranormal subjects. He has been an editor of Fate Magazine, the International UFO Reporter, and a board member of the Center for UFO Studies. In the 1990s, Clark authored the UFO book, an abridged version of the UFO Encyclopedia, which won the 1998 Benjamin Franklin Award in the Science Environment category, sponsored by the Independent Book Publishers Association. In its review of his 1999 book, Cryptozoology A to Z, Salon.com commented that Clark and co-author Lauren Coleman show a touchingly supportive nature for a subject often criticized for a lack of scientific rigor. He has appeared on ABC News Special Report, Unsolved Mysteries, Sightings, and the A&E Network. His most recent book is Unexplained, published in 2012 and is in its third edition. I would like to welcome to the program. I am honored, Jerome Clark. Mr. Clark, are you there? I certainly am, and thank you for that that nice build-up. I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> I wish my uh, intro one day sounds <laughs> half that good. But welcome to the show. I know that you don't do this often, and uh, uh, I really, I, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, with coming on with this, and we have. You have, we have a lot of uh, listeners out there. You have a lot of fans, and and the entire Art Bell crowd right now is just sitting and 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 listening. So I really, really do appreciate it. Okay, now Jimmy, if I could just interject, sure. Um, the UFO Encyclopedia was actually a multi-volume series that was published between 1990 and 1998, and there were five volumes in two different editions. And I, I, I have three. Myself, I think I told you that earlier this week. Yes. Uh, The uh, second uh, edition, which was actually in two volumes, but actually had more more material in it than the three volume. uh, Mine are so dog-eared and (laughs) you know, uh, well-read all of them, and uh, 
But uh, okay, so listen, really quick. Um, I start off every uh, I, we call them conversations here, um, and everybody out there is accustomed to what I do here. But I'll just tell you now, it's just a conversation. We're just sitting in my living room. And we're just talking. And if I find it interesting and you find it interesting, everybody out there is going to find it interesting. And and let's just have a good time with it. And I'm really excited. So, okay. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, – everybody knows that I, I, I run without notes. But uh, I'm going to ask a couple of quick generic things uh, for everybody out there so we can kind of uh, paint a picture for them. Uh, how did you get into, because you're one of the most read and, and published uh, authors in the genre, uh, ufology. How did you first get into this and what was your first book? What inspired you? Well, it was just the circumstance that I joined a book club and one of the introductory selections, you know, one of those deals where you get four books for a buck or something. The, my fourth choice was a was a book called The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt, who had headed Project Blue Book in the early 1950s. And before then, you know, I had some faint knowledge of flying saucers, and, uh, you know, I'd heard about them, but really had never looked into it or thought much about it. But when I saw the book advertised, I thought, well, okay, this might be interesting. And um, I read the book, and I was enthralled. Now, this is about 1957. Okay. Now, I'm just a kid. And um, that really sparked an interest that lasted me for decades afterwards. Now, as I often remark, that if I had read some other book on UFOs, for example, a book where someone had said that he had met with Venusians, and there were books like that around at the mm-hmm, time, mm-hmm. I would have thought, even as a kid, this is really silly. I'm not going to think about this or pursue this. But Rupel's book was one of the, still a classic of, of the literature. And it was a balanced and sober and sane look at the evidence. And uh, and that's what struck me, was this clearly, obviously sane and educated and thoughtful man who was experienced in investigations with the Air Force thought there might be something to this. Well, he was worth heeding. And so that kind of set me off on the lost highway that has led me to here. <laughs> well, it's interesting how you... Talk about Ruppelt's writing style, and I agree with you. Did that influence your writing style, too? Did you want to, uh, I hate to use the term black and white, you know, but just factual? Did you want to uh, try to uh, emulate that type of style? Well, he had a wonderful voice. He was, you were talking about, you know, just having a conversation. Right. Reading Ruppelt was like, you know, some guy who had some interesting life experience was talking to you. And I guess that he influenced me to the extent that I really prefer, you know, just simple declarative sentences in my writing that make clear what I'm thinking, what I'm trying to communicate, and one sentence follows logically from the next. And um, rather than get involved in some kind of, you know, convoluted sort of style, mm-hmm. But it was just that straightforward thinking that uh, that really impressed me. Although, in retrospect, I think that Ru- Ruppelt was a man without much of an imagination. He had sort of an engineer's mentality, and I think that kept him from really confronting some of the really difficult and highly strange aspects of UFO cases. But he still did a pretty good job of investigating cases. He wasn't good at close encounters. He couldn't deal with close encounters. So when he would come upon somebody's account of a close encounter, he would conclude just on the spot that it was some kind of psychological case. But he could deal with pilot sightings and radar visual cases and things like that. And he did some pretty good investigations that have stood up over the years. How did you, uh, when you first started off uh, in your research and uh, for, for books and stuff, how did you collect that information? You and I talked a little bit earlier, but we're going to get to that I, that thought in a second. But, you know, without the Internet, I mean, how did you... 
Are you going to your local libraries? Are you collecting newspapers from around the country? Are they delivered to your, I mean, how do you research, you know, back then? Because you, and the reason why I'm asking the question is because you have, your books are volumes and volumes of data. You know, how did you collect that? How did you manage that? Or did you have a team of people? Do you do, did you do it on your own? How did you pull that off? Well, I, I work pretty much on my own. Um, you know, there were, in the early 1960s, I found out that there were these teenage flying saucer clubs. Now, I don't think there are any teenage flying saucer clubs left. They've been gone for a long time. But they were quite active in the 50s and early 60s. And so I hooked up with a national, even international network of, of you know, bright young people who were interested in UFOs and were publishing these little newsletters. And then I began to subscribe to the newsletters and magazines published for adults who were interested in the subject. And, of course, I became an adult in time. And uh, so over time, you began to collect an enormous amount of material from correspondence, from subscriptions to newsletters that are long gone and very, very hard to find if you set out fresh trying to find them, Mm -hmm. and books and all those things. And if you held on to them, you had a whole lot of information that's not available to most people. Mm-hmm. And you never throw anything away. And um, and then as, as you get older, as I got older, I began you know, interviewing people who reported UFO experiences, and I began to go into newspaper archives, whether there was, they were preserved as physical newspapers or on you know, microfilm. And that's where I began the historical research into the airship phenomenon, phenomenon of, you know, the late 19th century and early 20th century, and just began to collect all kinds of stuff. And, you know, over the decades of a lifetime, if you're working at this, I mean, if you saw what my office looks like, you'd probably faint. Well, that was... Know, because uh, I've never <laughs> thrown anything away. <laughs> <laughs> that was my... I can only imagine what your garage... Uh, your <laughs> wife is a really tolerant person. I can only imagine. Oh, yes. Well, um, okay. The There's been, in in my opinion, and I think now as time has gone by, uh, it's it's more and more evident. We've gone through probably three or four distinct phases of, of eyewitness testimony and, and the type of things that they're seeing. And uh, um, not only that, but, but the, the photographs of, uh, you know, everything is kind of generational now and you can kind of, you know, look at what uh, uh, the fifties was bringing and then the sixties and the seventies and certainly uh, now today, why do you think, is the influence uh, a social thing for what possibly most people are seeing? And I'm referring to, you know, the flying saucer type thing from the 50s and 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 then the cigar shapes of the triangles and, you know, today. Why do you think that is? Well, boy, that's the question. Yes. I think that I knew the answer to that. I could tell you everything you need to know about UFOs. <laughs> but, but, but seriously, there, there are so many variables in these things that it's hard to say. Now, one thing I noticed as I was doing research for my encyclopedia series, mm-hmm. I was you know, studying this stuff, and so I was following the chronology you know, from the June 24, 1947, and the Kenneth Arnold sighting that really started everything. Right. And then going up to about 1990 is when the series ends. And I, it sort of confirmed my intuitive sense as someone who had begun paying attention in the late 1950s, in other words, about a decade into the UFO controversy, that it started out fairly straightforwardly with, with really interesting, I think, strongly evidential sightings of daylight disks and puzzling nocturnal lights and radar visuals and, you know, a lot of cases that really stand up as evidence of, you know, some foreign technology in our atmosphere. Right. And th- by the 1960s, though, there, there was an enormous amount 
of really strange stuff going on, or at least being reported. And that's why the second volume of the first edition of the UFO Encyclopedia is titled High Strangeness. It covers the 60s and 70s. And that was when people began to pay attention to UFO abduction reports. The Hill sighting comes along in mid-1960s, the revelation of the abduction aspect of that. And then you get start getting men in black stories and Mothman and all kinds of just incredible weirdness that appears to be inconsistent with the extraterrestrial hypothesis that had dominated most thinking about UFOs up till then. Right. And, 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 and I agree with that. Do you think, and this is, I've thought about this a lot. Do you think that even though you have the absent, uh, absence of, uh, of men in black and, and that type of, uh, 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 what's the word? I, you know that that aspect of of stories and 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 testimony, it was absent from the forties and fifties. Do you think it was just not noticed and possibly could have been going on? Maybe even back to you know the airship stuff. Well, if you dig deeply enough, and I believe me, I dug deeply when I was working on those encyclopedias. I went through archives and dug into stuff that nobody had even looked at, you know, for in years and years and years, including letters that people had written to, to long-defunct UFO organizations telling about their experiences, and cases that some ufologists had investigated and written up a report that got lost in a file somewhere. And I was restoring all of this stuff, mm-hmm. finding it in, and trying to get it back into the record. And so there's all kinds of stuff in those encyclopedia volumes hadn't been in any books before just because I was digging deeply. Right. And you can find precedent for almost anything. Somebody somewhere told a story that sounded like, you know, some story out of the 1960s and 1970s with, you know, all these incredibly high strangeness stories that were afloat. So nothing is really new. Is it, some of it comes seems to come forward to the fore for a while, or either that or people just begin consciously to look for it. And if you look for it, you'll find it. So it's really hard to say whether you know these things were always whether these things are new or we're just starting or we focus on them and think of them as significant. I think that in the 1950s, if you came upon a really, really strange UFO story, most people just couldn't deal with it because they were looking for something like, you know, a daylight disc sighting or maybe even, you know, the object had touched briefly on the ground for it had shot off or something. And the really strange stories were just simply outside anybody's ability really to comprehend or to think about. So mostly I found that when you got a really strange story, it was often somebody's first person account. Somebody had written a letter to a UFO group and said, this happened to me. And the UFO groups tended to be conservative and most of them were inclined just to, you know, not even to respond to the letter, not wanting to encourage the guy who they assumed is a nut Mm -hmm. or a hoaxer. Mm -hmm. What did you think? This is just kind of a direct question, but with um Adamski and with Billy Meyer those two stories although they're you know they're not connected but they they appeared at a time when uh i mean the stories were getting more fantastical as you were just referring to what do you think about those two cases specifically and then let's move on but i'm just very curious uh on how you how you uh looked at those two cases well, I think Adamski's story is more historically significant in the sense that this was the beginning of a kind of flying saucer religion, which was just almost, in, well, was an inevitable development. People were going to make a religion around these unknown objects that were inscrutable, that whose implications for us could be literally cosmic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, in in the early years, in the 1950s, the more conservative UFO organizations were appalled 
at the emergence of the contactee movement, which really begins in in the modern sense in the in Southern California in nineteen early nineteen fifties. And they thought of these stories as clearly farcical right. and crazy. And the newspapers loved to publicize these stories because they were farcical and crazy. While the UFO organizations were trying to make UFO study and UFO sightings respectable, that you could talk about them in respectable society and governments and scientists would take the report seriously and investigate them. But Adamski and his other contactee associates were really subverting that quest for respectability for ufology. And so they hated Adamski, and they were always down on him, and I can certainly understand why from their perspective. But I can also see from a broader historical perspective that, yes, these guys were going to come along no matter what. Yeah, it was kind of in, inevitable. Well, what about uh, uh, Billy Meyer? What did you think about that? Well, I am deeply skeptical of anybody, any contactee, who comes forward with photographs and alleged physical evidence. I think that contactees who tell incredibly strange stories can be sincere, that they can really believe that it happened to them. But since it didn't happen to them in a physical sense, if they produce photographs and other physical evidence, they have to be consciously fabricating this. One of the things that hit me, and I don't want to dwell on Billy Meyer, I just don't, but uh, when I would watch those films, I just thought to myself, how can somebody buy into this? But yet they did by the thousands. And I just thought, how can they not see what I am seeing? Did, did you have the same impression? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> like I said, I don't want to. I hate I, to say more because people get, some people take this seriously, and yes. which is their right, but. <laughs> They also get mad at you if you don't agree with them. So. You know, and I'm not trying to stir the pot here. I'm just trying to uh, convey what my eyes are seeing and what I'm seeing. And you just want to turn around and look at other people going, come on, really? You know, now, not to say that some of those photographs weren't really well done. <laughs> well, it's it's sort of like, was it W.C. Fields who said, who do you believe? No, it's Groucho Marx. Who do you believe, me or your own eyes? Yeah, right, exactly. Or your lying eyes, yeah. <laughs> oh, now, and, and so getting, kind of staying on the same subject, but I want to get to the the airship. We're going to do a little chronological thing. We're going to move forward, uh, just kind of, well, kind of like your paper today that uh, was absolutely fascinating. And and I read it. Um, if there, You know what? I'll get a link up. Is it okay if I post it uh, on the website tonight for everybody to read? Sure. Okay. Um, and then we will uh, we will take care of that. And uh, the uh, the web and uh, the producers in the other room here at the studio are probably panicking, wondering what we're talking about. But <laughs> so it'll have to be dealt with after the show. But anyway, back to the airships. The thing for me that I I, I find most fascinating uh, with the airship wave in the late 1800s is that, um, and I know this sounds simple now to think about but back then communication was non-existent there was you know there wasn't even phones you know you had uh, uh maybe morse code you know possibly but uh um, well there were phones uh, well, okay 1870 we had phones 1880 oh no that's a little early no yeah exactly uh, turn of the century there were phones yeah turn of the century but so in but the the but the communication was direct communication instantaneous stuff was not non-existent but yet you had these reports coming uh uh from around the country some of them a few days apart where you know there was it was impossible for people to communicate with each other but yet they were apparently seeing the same thing and how how can we safely explain that away unless it was really happening? Well, I don't think there's any question that people were seeing anomalous things, things that even now are difficult, if not impossible, to explain in conventional terms. The airship phenomenon, it, it, the more we dig into it, the, it's usually thought to have started in 1896 in, in Northern California. But we know now that it goes back years before that 
And people were seeing these anomalous airships. Now, an airship is like a Zeppelin. It's a lighter-than-air but controlled aerial machine. And that was also the vocabulary of the time. Mm -hmm. And they looked like, um, you know, they looked like airships. But there were no airships in America uh, during the 19th century. And, in fact, there was there was there were airships or dirigibles didn't really come to the United States until the uh, early 20th century, although they had been flown in, in, in Europe, particularly Germany, during the 19th century. But, but they were not an American phenomenon. And what people were describing are things that are not in any aeronautics history. They're just... I don't think most aeronautical historians are even aware of the airship waves of the late 19th century and the early 20th century because they're just so outrageous. They couldn't have happened right. according to conventional thinking, conventional history. But people were seeing and reporting these extraordinary airships, and sometimes, according to stories, sometimes they landed and people came out of them, and I, they, they were people. They were like people who would say, well, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an American inventor, and I invented this machine in a shop in Iowa, and I'm flying it around the country. So you get these stories like this, and, and many of them were hoaxes. But not all of them appear to be hoaxes. Where does the idea, uh, it, it has to germinate from something. You know, where does the idea, come? It, 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 is it a uh, some kind of urban myth that was spreading around the country at that time. And it was, you know, the old telephone game, you know, and, and it got more and more exaggerated. But also the other thing uh, that I have read over the years in my research into this, the thing that confused me was people commenting about wings and propellers before. <laughs> I don't think anybody had ever seen a, you know, a wing, the, the Wright brothers were still years off. And so how does, uh, you know, where does this germinate from? It's got to start somewhere. Well, it starts in the, in, the, in the milieu of popular fascination with flight. Everybody knew that somebody was going to invent a heavy, heavier-than-air flying machine soon. And um, there were almost every small town had a tinker who was working in a shop and trying to invent a flying machine. And there was popular fiction about aeronauts flying their their inventions, and there were even stories that these things could be used in warfare, that you could actually throw grenades from a flying machine and blow up things on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so, there, I mean, there was a vision of what the 20th century would bring in, in terms of aerial technology. There was an enormous amount of interest in it. And when the sightings, when people began claiming that they'd actually seen airships, everybody assumed that somebody had secretly invented an airship. And that so, you, even in, in the spring of 1897, when there were multiple reports all over the country, Either the people were laughed at, and, and there were jokes, the usual jokes about drinking and stuff, or they, or if they people took this story seriously, they said, oh, finally someone has invented an airship, and this will be announced to the public soon when he's just flying it around the country, he and his associates, on an experimental flight, but we'll know about it soon. Well, nothing like that happened. But the but reports of anomalous airships continued, uh, you know, well into the 19 teens, what? and these were described as, you know, big flying machines with big wings and, and uh, attached to balloons and things like that. I mean, they didn't they weren't they didn't sound like modern UFOs, but they were the period's equivalent of UFOs. When. Um uh, when the reports uh, that, you know, I read some today uh, with uh, your paper, but when those reports came out and there was a lot of similar things, you know, they talked to the people on the craft and, you know, they talked to, the, you know, the captain or whatever. And they, so there was all of these similar things, but was, uh, and I, and I remember the Illinois, Iowa connection. Okay. But w was it ever, uh, uh, reveal that 
that one of these airships was built in Illinois or Iowa around that time? Was it, did that ever, you know, today, was that, has that ever been found out? No, and there have been several people who have done actual investigations. I remember one of the stories, supposedly the aeronaut in an airship told somebody that he he gave his name and he said that he is from Goshen, New York. And um, Daniel Cohen wrote a book about the 1897 airship, and he lived within driving distance of Goshen in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And he actually went there and did a lot of, you know, research and, and, you know, and and tried to find if such a man existed, and there was no record of him. And none of these stories have, you know, where the supposed inventor said where he came from, none of these stories pan out. I mean, they're just, all they are is a series of strange anecdotes from the period. And and some of these people are people of good reputation who seem credible, newspaper editors, police officers, you know, the kind of people that you would tend to take seriously. But all that exists of that is preserved in these old newspapers. And there were no airshipologists back then that were going around interviewing witnesses, trying to right, analyze right, them. Right, 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 yes. And that, of course, really hurts us. But... I did find while I was digging, doing this archival research for the encyclopedia series, I did find letters from people remembering things. Now, this, these, some of these letters were like in the early 1950s, so some of these people were still alive from the turn of the century. Okay. And they would write and they would say, back around 1900 or 1903, I saw this. And they would describe from their own personal memory of what they had seen and although they, the term airship had long gone out of use, mm-hmm. I recognize that, that if they had reported the, sub, the sighting at the time it had been reported in the local newspaper, it would have been called an airship. So even and, and Ed Rupel did interview an old man who, as a boy, had seen an airship in Northern California. So there were actually a few people, living people, at least in the early part of the UFO age, who, you know, were actually living link to that era. Do you think uh, in your research now, and uh, and we can talk about your, uh, we can move on to the paper today, um, anomalies. Uh, do you think they were actually seeing something now and it wasn't imagination? Well, uh, they were certainly experiencing something that was extraordinary and still I think defies explanation but I don't think you know these these were literally true that there was something going on that people were experiencing and experiencing vividly I don't know that these were events because there's no evidence that anything like this happened or could have happened but the paradox is that you have all this really striking testimony by apparently sincere people. And the uh, the editors, the writers uh, for the for the publications really went out of their way, it seems, with each of the witnesses to make sure that they describe that witness as a very upstanding citizen. <laughs> right, which is not necessarily uh, a validation because there was... A, a lot of humor in those days. For example, I remember one case from New Mexico in the early 20th century where the witnesses was described as sober on that particular day. Yes, yes. (laughs) (laughs) It was sort of a joke. I mean, sometimes it was meant seriously, but other times it was an ironic joke and it was like a wink to the reader who may have actually like if it was a small town paper, the reader of the small town paper would probably know that guy and know that he had a reputation as a practical joker. Right. You know, they fell, you know, short of saying, yes, uh, and John Smith, who has never lied ever in his life, you know, right. <laughs> and they've, and they really, and, and that is a consistent, um, uh, thing that I've seen from time uh, for, for each, 
for each story on the airship. Uh, they just want to make it they they want to make it perfectly clear that this witness is the most honest man in the history of the earth. <laughs> you, you know, know there, th- that's one of the problems we have with the American end of the airship era. So we're dependent on the kind of wild and woolly journalistic standards, and I use the word standards loosely from that period. Now, if similar things had not been reported internationally, you could argue that, oh, this was all a joke and the papers ran on it and so on. But other newspapers in countries like Canada and New Zealand and Australia and, and Great Britain and so on reported very similar things, with, but they were writing in a really more sober journalistic voice. So there's no question that there was an international phenomenon of anomalous airships in that period. And it's it's not easy to explain away. And I, the thing that I want to make clear, uh, well, to myself, too, as well, but to everybody out there, you have to remember there was no direct line of communication that was, you know, instantaneous and, and you know, the publishing of, of descriptions and drawings and uh, all of this testimony, it, it wasn't uh, instantaneous, and but yet the descriptions are very similar, like you're saying, from Canada to the United, you know, all across the the country. And this went on for years. This wasn't just something that just, you know, uh, was a one time event. And for it to happen like it did, I think there was something there. I when you had said earlier, and this is one of the things I find most fascinating with this uh, era, and we we can move on in a second, is the Zeppelin, you know, the design, that specific uh, description that they were giving, it hadn't it, it, it hadn't been invented yet, but yet the descriptions were all similar. I just find that fact, and 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 uh, you know, uh, uh, crews on the ship. But see, or on the ships, I should say, we're disembarking and going out and doing things, interacting with, uh, and sometimes even speaking foreign languages. You know, a, lot, it, a word of caution should be inserted here. Many of the stories were fabrications. In fact, I had assumed they were all fabrications until I did somehow in my work, I got caught up in this one particular case that seemed really genuinely intriguing. And I did some research and had some correspondence with an archivist and collected a bunch of records and found out that that the witnesses were absolutely impeccable and that, and that one of them in particular had been so affected by the experience of meeting this airship and its crew that he that it affected the rest of his life. And I found press accounts of his sort of obsessive memories of this event, which was corroborated by a very highly regarded rabbi from uh, Beaumont, Texas, who also reported that he had gone to the scene while the event was, uh, the incident was occurring and himself had met the same airship crew members. And this story was really interesting to me. The rabbi in particular was a highly educated man who started the first temple in Beaumont and um, was very highly regarded in the whole community, not just in the tiny Jewish community of Beaumont, but by everybody, the, the community leaders and shakers. He wrote columns for the local newspaper. He was involved in education projects. And um, this was really about as impressive a guy as you can imagine. He he appeared in a book that came out oh, about five years after the airship sighting, as, cited as one of the leading citizens of Beaumont. There was a big biography of him, and um, it, it, it just you couldn't imagine a more impressive guy. I'm wondering where this is going, so please continue. <laughs> well, if This persuaded me that amid all the hoax stories about airship landings, this one just did not look like a hoax. Because he was a real guy. He was a real guy, and so was was the rancher, J.R. Ligon, who 
with his son claimed this experience. They, allegedly, the airship had landed on their ranch, which was just outside town, late one night. I believe it was April 19th, 1897. And the crew had come in and asked for water. And they'd sat in his house, and he'd filled up some, some jugs for them. And they talked with him, and, and they said, oh, yeah, they were flying around the country, and they'd invented this thing. And, and um, they were were from the Midwest, and they would be revealing this. And while this was going on, apparently word got out, and the rabbi Levy, his name was, yes, went to the site, and um, he claimed that he had seen these men and talked with him, and he was he was so rattled by the whole experience, he said, that he couldn't even remember what they'd said to him, that the whole thing just seemed unreal to him. Did the... Um at that moment when you're doing this type of research, like you said, you thought you, you know, everything was, you know, just fictitious hoaxes and well-written funny stories, but then you come across this Levy story in Beaumont and you find out that this guy was an actual historical, you know, you can go and, and, and find records of, uh, I know that he didn't, he built us, he built a school, I think too, as well. Right. Yeah. And so there's, this guy really did exist, upstanding guy. He's a rabbi, uh, you know, built a church. And like you were saying, it not only was he uh, big in the Jewish community, but he did things for the community in the city of Beaumont specific, that, that were outside of the Jewish community. So here's yeah, a guy. He, he was really an honored citizen of the community, you know, quite outside, you know, his religious work. He participated in the community and was and I, I'm pretty sure that a rabbi in Beaumont, Texas, in 1890s is probably considered an exotic specimen. <laughs> the only but one he, in town, for sure, yeah, yes, he, yes. But he disarmed anybody who might have been suspicious, and he was very well-liked. And, and uh, you know, you, you see references to him in all kinds of places, quite apart from you know his strange, anomalous airship testimony. Um, now, we keep... Uh, uh, let's let's stop and explain a couple of things, a couple of terms here. What is uh, experience anomalies for everybody? Let's let's start there. Well, about twenty years ago, while I was working on a book, um, trying to make sense of people's claims of extraordinary phenomena, and it was obvious to me that many stories that are told by people who to all appearances are sane and sincere are just unprovable. And they also just seem completely unlikely to have happened from any of our understanding of how reality works, how biology works, you know, how the possible works. And yet you have this testimony that is genuinely puzzling even while it's stubbornly unprovable. So what do you do with that? And for centuries, there have been debates about extraordinary phenomena. And one side says, yes, these things happen. You know, they're real phenomena. They're part of our world. And then on the other side, you have people, debunkers, who just completely reject this and keep demanding proof in the form of bodies or or whatever. You know, right, just right. Something you can take into a laboratory. And the argument goes on and on and on, and neither side succeeds in making its case, ultimately. So what do you do with that? You begin to wonder, maybe there's a category error here, and that people are trying to make these things either more or less than they really are. That these things... One thing we know about them is that these things exist in memory and testimony. Proving they exist in any other way is very difficult to do. Now, but you, you can't connect it with human pathology. You can't, if you could connect, say that anybody who said that he had seen like a ghost or, or Bigfoot or something right. was a mental case or a known liar, right. that's fine. Then, but that isn't the way it works either. Well, and are you referring to, I mean, is this just a broad stroke of the pen uh, with experience anomalies? Everything from, uh, 
you know, I, I'm just going to reach here uh, from the left saying uh, has talked to an ET, let's say, all the way to the far right where they jumped on a spaceship and, and flew around Jupiter and came back. You well, know, is it that broad of a stroke? Well, those things sound like experience anomalies to me, but what are not experience anomalies are event anomalies where you can demonstrate that something, some this world event happened, that you have independent evidence that goes outside memory and testimony. For example, you look at some of the real hardcore UFO evidence, and you're dealing with things that seem irreducible. You have radar visual cases. Mm-hmm. You have cases where someone has reported a landing, and the, the case was well investigated and documented, the physical traces were taken into a laboratory mm-hmm. and shown to be very strange indeed and suggestive of a, of a technology that we don't have. Mm-hmm. Those cases exist. That's what I call the core phenomenon. This is the signal in all the noise. And these things are scientifically approachable. If you have radar visual, you have instrumented testimony, you have physical traces, other kinds of physical evidence, you have something that scientists can work with. Right. And scientists can, can show that either this is really interesting or it's not so interesting. You can solve it. And if the, when we talk about the extraterrestrial hypothesis or the ETH, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about physical spacecraft visiting the Earth's atmosphere, presumably because the galaxy, as many astronomers now believe, is densely inhabited. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So eventually they're going to come over here, and maybe they're already here. Well, that's a different question from someone who claims some kind of incredibly highly strange incident with men in black or abducting aliens or monsters and things like that. Those things don't work in the extraterrestrial hypothesis, and they also are unprovable. All you can determine if you investigate cases like this is that, yes, as far as I can tell, the witness or witnesses really believe this happened to them. And it seems unlikely that they mistook some conventional thing for something very unconventional. What is, uh, because we're going to jump into this a little bit deeper right now, so uh, define ETH for us, uh, the extraterrestrial uh, hypothesis. Well, the extraterrestrial hypothesis actually goes back to the 19th century. And this was the hypothesis that there's evidence that visitors from other worlds, physical visitors and physical craft, are visiting the Earth and people have seen them. They're at least seen their, their ships. And there was speculation to that effect during the airship wave at the turn of the last century. Mm-hmm. Some small number of people speculated that these were actually Martian spaceships. That's right. Because everybody thought that Mars was inhabited in those days. So if there were spaceships here, they're probably from Mars. So there was, And there were even hoaxes that played to the idea of visiting Martians. In the in the uh, early 20th century, a writer named Charles Fort, who I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners have heard of and probably have read, collected all kinds of anomalies from old newspapers, reports of just a range of not psychic phenomena, but other kinds of weirdness that came to be called Fortian phenomena after him. Fort thought that reports of strange lights and shapes in the sky were probably best explained as evidence of visitation from another planet. And so he invented, essentially, he's usually credited with inventing the extraterrestrial hypothesis. He didn't call it that. That term wasn't invented until the 1960s. But when when flying saucers came along in 1947, a very small number of people, mostly people associated with the Fortean society, thought that these might be. And by the 1950s, this idea had become widespread and There were, you know, science fiction movies that played to that, and there was a lot of speculation, and that that that's what flying saucers were. And the first generation of ufologists almost universally assumed that's what they were dealing with. 
the the, um, the wave that happened uh, in the fifties, and you, you referred to it earlier, and and I always think of like the Mojave Desert when I think about this. What uh, the um, oh, the 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 tin foil on the head crowd where they were talking about, uh, you know, going up and, and Venus and, and Martians and spacecraft were, do you, do you see a relationship between the two anomalies, the experience anomalies that were going on, uh, not only in with the airship stuff, but where is there a need is for society to just all see and, and talk about the same thing? Well, it's a very difficult question. Now, with the first generation of contactees, you're dealing with two, there are two kinds of people who are claiming communication with space people. One was the Adamski crowd, who claimed physical interactions with physical space people. And photographs. And photographs, and the Adamski even allegedly had tracks of Venusian that he'd met in the desert. Mm -hmm. And then there were the people, the visionaries, who claimed psychic communications with with UFO beings or beings from other dimensions or planets. And these people would basically hear voices in their head and they'd go into a trance. And I think that these people were overwhelmingly sincere. It's certainly their actions suggested that they that they really believed that space people were talking to them. They never provided physical evidence of this. It was just the messages to themselves that were supposed to convey conviction. That if you listen to this, you could listen to them channeling some gibberish from some alien, and you were supposed to be really impressed and think, boy, this person couldn't have made this up, so it must be true. And if you've ever sat in a channeling session on one level, it's, it is an interesting experience. On another level, the information that's coming out of the person in the trance is clearly not, you know, great cosmic wisdom. Right. <laughs> and and the, 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 one, the one thing that, uh, and you touched upon it a little bit, very sincere. And when you see uh, photographs and, and film uh, of this period, the, these are as normal of a of a citizen as you can imagine. You know, it, it looks like your next door neighbor. It's not a, not somebody that you would think uh, would make something up. But I think sincere is the right way to put it. Yeah, I, I used to know a guy. He died a few years ago. He's a very nice guy. He worked as a car repairman at a, at a body shop in um, Waukegan, Illinois. That's where I was born. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, this guy believed that he was had been appointed by aliens from another planet to be their guy on Earth. In fact, in, in effect, he would rule the Earth once the mass landings happened. And they kept giving him dates, and of course the prophecies always went unfulfilled, as they always do. Mm-hmm. But if you met this guy, he was a family man, he, he had a nice wife, and he had a good relationship with his kids. He was the nicest guy. I mean, he was just a sweet guy. But he would get these psychic messages, and he believed they were true. And And I listened to him, and I was sort of, he was kind of somewhere between a friend and a subject for me. And I recorded a lot of this stuff, and it was just incredibly you know, imaginative, went all over the place, and it just it had nothing to do with the life that this guy led otherwise, and that no one would ever suspect that he had this incredibly rich, I guess you'd call it a fantasy life, but he, except that he believed it to be true. Like a Walter Mitty type? Well, it's a psychological phenomenon. You know, it's a, it's a non-pathological psychic phenom- uh, psychological phenomenon, according to, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists who studied it, that you can indeed hear voices in your head unless they're telling you to kill your mother-in-law or something like that. Right. That's not good. Right. But if they're just yammering on about, you know, harmless things, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just one of the, can be just a, a kink in your brain. It just works that way. 
Um, we're we're at the top of the hour. Let's uh let's take a quick break, a couple of minutes, and then when we come back, I want to carry on. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some fairies. Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> All right, Jerry. Just stay with us. Uh, take a break, a couple of minutes, and we'll be back right after this. KJCR, Jerome Clark, fade to black. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us. One eight hundred nine one six six two three two. That's the number you need to call when you are seeking spiritual enlightenment and searching for your true purpose here on earth. www.lovespellstoday.com. They provide psychic readings, love spells, reversal of spells, custom spells, chakra balancing, energy work. Divine guidance is just one phone call away. Call 1-800-916-6232 for your free psychic reading. I did. And tell them Jimmy sent you. Man, Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. My name is Nick Dominguez. Hi, I'm Rex Dominguez, and I listen to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Jimmy is your preacher. Amen. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. K-J-C-R. JimmyChurchRadio.com Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back. KJCR, this is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We're on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Talking to Jerome Clark. Now, Jerry, are, are you with us? Yep. Okay, yep. great. Um, in reading, this this is the thing, and, and I can't wait for everybody to uh, to actually see the uh, and read through uh, your presentation um, later on tonight after the show so they can understand. But when I was reading through it today, I had a couple of real aha moments <laughs> and I actually went back and, and, and I read everything a second time because it just it for me, it, it just clarified some of my own personal beliefs. And and one of those anomalies that uh, that is consistent throughout time, going back ages and generations, is uh, you know uh, uh, fairies and and relationships that uh, people have had with things throughout history that are unprovable. And so let's let's just let's start from the beginning with that, and and you you go back to Scottish myth too. So if you want to start there, that's fine. But uh, please tell us about it because I'm I'm telling you, I had a real aha moment with this, and it was just it was uh, clarifying. So please see if you can clarify everybody like I was today. Well, most of us, in fact, all of us, I'm sure, when we hear the word fairy tale, assume that the ref. This is some ridiculous thing that is just absurd and unbelievable and would take up the time of no serious person. In fact, there is enormous literature, uh, mostly by folklorists and anthropologists, of uh, the international tradition of fairies. And any society anywhere has a fairy tradition. They don't all always call them fairies, but it's a tradition of of a race of of supernatural people who live hidden next to us. Now, when you say that, let me just jump in really quick. Uh, Asian, uh, 
Persian, everything. Egyptian, African, you know, when yeah. you say everything, you, you, you're, you're going across the board. Yeah, the Indian tribes of the Americas all have these traditions, and everywhere. Pacific Islands, you go anywhere. There is a tradition. And in all these traditions, people report not just legends and rumors and, you know, folklore, but you always will find people who, with a completely straight face, will tell you about their own personal experience with one of these supernatural entities. And um, the, the, one of the great works in the history of the chronicling of the fairy tradition was a book published in 1791 by the Reverend Robert Kirk. The name of the book is The Secret Commonwealth. And... Um, uh, Kirk was a pastor at a rural parish. He was a Presbyterian minister. And he was intensely interested in these stories that he was hearing from his parishioners about what they called the good people or the gentry or the fair folk. They didn't call them fairies. They were afraid to call them that because they believed that the fairies could be invisible and they might be listening to them and they didn't like people talking about their business. So they had these euphemisms. But Kirk, who was an educated man among people who weren't terribly educated, but they were telling him these stories, and, and um, he really got interested in them. And, he, and even in the 18th century, among educated people, among the elites of society, belief in fairies was would get you nothing but ridicule. So even in the 18th century, there was great skepticism of this. But Kirk was really interested. He wrote this down, and, and then he writes this book of, on the assumption that these creatures are real. And he describes what they're like and what they do. And it's really an amazing book, and it's, almost, it's one of the great classic works in whether you call it the lore of the supernatural or, or folklore. It's a book that's that's admired by just about anybody who reads it, including, you know, scholars who have traced this tradition through the centuries. And uh, what he described is still pretty much true of the fairy tradition as it has continued into the present. Now, belief in fairies, of course, is pretty rare now, but people still have these experiences. And I don't mean just crazy people. I mean, normal people. And, and well, and and I, I just want to be clear: um, we're not talking necessarily about fairies, uh, you know, with wings and and a magic no. wand, you know, dancing around no. with no, that, a fairy that, that, dust. That, that is not the fairy of tradition. That's the fairy that was invented in nineteenth century Victorian children's literature. No, what people generally in the, the fairies of tradition are don't have wings, and they're, they're usually not always small. And um, they're dressed in kind of, you know, exotic or, or rustic clothing. And they're, they're not ent entities, according to the traditional belief, that you'd want to run into, because they're, they can be very nasty and they're unpredictable, and uh, you don't want to see them. And they also have... Uh, a society. I mean, they, they, you know, they have neighbors, they have houses, they have uh, lives, uh, structure, and community. We just can't see it. Right. They have a queen. Yeah. Right. Least, exactly. According to the the at least the fairies of the Celtic tradition of Ireland and Scotland. But anyway, so you, anyway, you read a book by an anthropologist or a folklorist about the tradition, and you'll come upon not just you know the legends. Which, you, which is what you're expecting to encounter, of course, but actual testimony. And you think, what? You know, <laughs> this, people don't, but this, isn't, this doesn't really happen. It's just a belief from a naive, superstitious past. But no, there are people all over who believed that they had had these experiences, and these experiential claims also fueled the tradition. So the tradition wasn't just out of nowhere. It was came out of people's alleged first-hand experiences. 
Now, folklorists have dealt with this in interesting ways. In the 19th century, when the when the folklorists would collect these stories in the field, and somebody would say, "Well, I had I was one night I was coming home, and I saw this light, and, and within this light there were these little people dancing, and I heard this." beautiful music, the most beautiful music I've ever heard, and they tried to get me to go into the circle with them, and I knew better than to do that, because I knew if I went in the circle, they'd take me away with them. So you get these stories of, you know, just completely naive testimony by people who <laughs> didn't seem to be joking. Right. In fact, we're rather frightened. And so, the folklorists thought, there's something, we got to explain this. And so they would come up with different explanations. One of the popular explanations was that the the Picts, who were the people who inhabited the British Isles before the Celts arrived, um, were hadn't been completely wiped out. That they were still alive and they were hiding in the hills and caves and stuff. Well, that was a pop, actually a popular theory. It was proposed in a book published in 1890, and that sort of died for absolute want of any evidence whatsoever. And um, and what one recent book, the author is dealing with the tradition, and she's, like anybody who comes into this, bumps up against these experiential claims. And she says, well, they they, they came out of, out of sightings of severely deformed people, period. No footnote, no further discussion. No, no proof, evidence. right, 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 right. I mean, and so, but one very classic work in, in folklore was published in 1911, by Walter Evans Wentz. His book titled The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. Around the turn of the last century, um, Evans Wentz, who was a young anthropologist, traveled through the Celtic regions of Western Europe, which was included Brittany and France and then and then Scotland and Ireland, and collected testimony about the surviving tradition of fairy lore. And he collected a lot of them, you know, the legends and so on, which is interesting stuff in itself. But he also, you know, kept running into people, told them they're in personal encounters. And these stories are very strange. These are not the fairies of Walt Disney. These are really strange stories. <laughs> as, as strange in their own way as UFO abduction narratives are today. And he concluded that that fairies do exist as some kind of, you know, supernatural race that it is possible under some circumstances to encounter directly. What I want you to um, explain to me the, the the connection again. We're just talking. I've read it, but explain the connection with modern ufology and contactees and that anomaly with the the fairy tales and and stories from uh, hundreds of years ago. Well, what, what these fairy encounters are, are classic experience anomalies. They exist in memory and testimony, but nowhere else. You can't prove them. You can't disprove them. All you have is this very strange people, this very strange testimony of people who recounting experiences that to them were vivid and had the resonance of like real encounters with real things in the real world, Mm -hmm. even though they weren't. Mm -hmm. Now, an experience anomaly is really something that is neither real nor real, but nor unreal, but happens in some kind of, you know, threshold or liminal zone between, you know, real life encounter and, this sort of encounter we have in our dreams or in our imagination. It is something that kind of partakes of elements of both. It's kind of like an extremely anomalous hallucination or an image from a dream that just pops into waking consciousness and even apparently waking vision. It is something that is clearly beyond current knowledge. But it happens to people all the time. And I don't mean just fairies, but all kinds of extraordinary entities that people report seeing, whether 
you know, monsters, dragons, or aliens, sure, 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 things like that. Have you um, have you experienced anything yourself? Not, I'm not talking, you know, anything direct, or maybe you have. I, I yeah, don't know I the have, answer. Is. Yes, I have directly experienced. Not alas, an elfin figure. Oh, well, I'd love to <laughs> encounter one of those. <laughs> okay, but I actually did have an experience one time. And, and and that causes you to, of course, because I've had, you know, a couple of little things that have, have popped up too, where you just stop and go, okay, all right, there's a lot of consistency here now, but now I've had my experience and I've got to take this a little bit more serious. And can you tell me about the experience that you had? Well, the experience was, a, it didn't really work like that for me. I've spent most of my life reading people's strange stories or hearing people's strange stories and accepting that, yeah, you know, this could happen. I'm, I'm sure this person had this experience. However you interpret it, the person seems sincere about it, and this does seem really hard to explain. But when I had my experience, I absolutely refused to believe that I had seen something extraordinary, even though everything about it is, I look back in retrospect, and it happened to me three times in one summer. And, uh, but I, and each time it was only the last time I saw it that I realized this is really, really strange. And if anybody else had told me this story, I'd have recognized immediately. This is really an extraordinary anomaly. But what I encountered was, uh, basically a, a phantom quadruped that vanished in front of my eyes in in my front lawn. Okay. Three, on three summer evenings, the last time my wife was with me. Continue. I mean, I've got 50 questions I can ask, but I'll just let you just tell the story. Uh, what well, happened the first time? The first time, we in those days, we had a dog that we really loved. and and um, But if we let her out the front door, she just wandered through the neighborhood, and we did spend hours trying to find her. Mm-hmm. So we built a big fence in the back, so she was... So she had, could go out in the back and run around and, and wasn't confined to the house all the time. So when I saw this thing, I, I'd come home about 10.30 at night. I'd been working on my encyclopedia. Uh, in those days, I rented an office elsewhere in our little town. And so I was coming home about 10.30, and I saw this big thing, which I couldn't see very well, but it was like a big quadruped, and I assumed it was a, a big dog. And Misha, our dog, was a big dog. Uh, what is Misha doing on the front porch? And um, and I started walking t- toward her. I let her retrace. It's 15 feet between where I parked my car and our front door. And um, this thing was on the landing, at the top of the landing, lying on the top landing. And as I began walking toward it, trying to get a better look at it, because I couldn't quite see it, very well, to, so that I could identify it, but it had the contours of a large dog. How how tall? How a hundred pound, fifty pounds, two feet, four feet? A uh, hundred pounds, I would guess. So a good size, a dog, a, a yeah, big, maybe, big dog. Maybe it was about. You know, we had, Misha was an Oshbosh, which is a dog that looks a lot like a yellow lap. Okay. Except a little bit meatier, beefier, and. Um, so I see this thing go off the front porch, heading toward our neighbors. And and it's as it moved, it sort of stayed in the shadow. This was a summer night, and there was lights from the street lights. But I could, but it sort of stayed in the shadows. So I could never get a good look at it. And as I was following it, trying to figure out what kind of animal it was, by this time I knew it wasn't our dog. Mm-hmm. It just disappeared. How close did you get to it? Oh, man. Probably no more than six, seven feet. No less than six, seven feet. Oh, so you were right there. Okay, there's no quite... It's not like you were 50 yards away. Oh, no, no. No, no. you're right on, so you can see... Okay. And then about two weeks later, exactly the same thing happened. Now, I was not thinking that I had seen a ghost or anything weird. I kept even though it had disappeared in front of my eyes. This is how crazy this is. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking, okay, what kind of animal is this? And I began, I 
pull down books on wildlife and domestic pets and stuff from my bookshelves. I have books on just about everything in my library and did some internet searches trying to figure out, talk with my wife and talk with people in the neighborhood. And, and it, it just, nobody knew what I was talking about. And well, I you can't exactly look up disappearing quadruped, the, that no. chapter in a but book. I had this fixation that this was something normal and was just unusual and I could solve it. Right. I, I was not thinking I had seen anything extraordinary. Okay. So finally, through a bizarre circumstances, a, a couple of weeks after my second sighting, my in those days, my mother was alive and she had MS. And she would sometimes fall out of bed and she couldn't get back up. And so we'd have to go over in the middle of the night to help her. And she had this service that would call us and say that she needed help. So Helene and I got out of bed and we went over to my mother's, got her back into bed. We come back and there's a light on in the neighbor's house. And we knew our neighbor wasn't there. And so it leads to a bunch of stuff. We had to call the police and stuff. And, and it turned out that the house was, <laughs> there was some electrical wire problem and the house would have burned down. But for the circumstance that we happened to be awake at quarter to four in the morning, and uh, could see this happening. So anyway, the police come over, and we always get taken care of. So we turn back to go to our house, which is right next door, mm -hmm. and there's the thing on the porch. <sighs> and I yelled, oh, oh, man. there it is, and I was, I this time I was going to get a good look at it. And who was with you? My wife and any anybody else. That's no. By that time, the police and some other people who would help get them get in the house were gone. But just oh. us two, quarter to four in the morning, and I ran as fast as I possibly could toward this thing, which my wife also saw, and it it does exactly what it did the other two times. It goes off the porch to, in a southwest direction to our neighbor's yard and vanishes there. And that was the end of it. No moral, no purpose. It was just weird. Did you ever, uh, uh, you didn't mention, did you see its face? No, it was, it was just like. A, because it was moving away from you. Yeah, and it also was like a shade. It wasn't like a full bodied thing. It was like, sometimes I describe this more like the idea of a thing than the thing itself. You know, that's really spooky. You know, that's what you're telling me is really spooky. That's a campfire story. Yeah. And what I think it was, was something out that uh, of, of a folklore that I am familiar with. It also has its experiential component, and that is the phenomenon of the black dog, the supernatural canine, which is also a worldwide tradition. If you know Robert Johnson's famous blues song. Oh, absolutely. Hellhound on my trail. A that's absolutely. what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Because in 1930s Mississippi, among African Americans, there was a robust tradition of black dogs. I think that what I saw was part of that tradition of weird stuff. So when finally, and this happened when you were writing the encyclopedia, right? So this was in the 90s? No, I was writing, actually I wasn't writing the encyclopedia, I was done with the encyclopedia. I was, but must have been writing something else because this was in 2000. Okay, I so, finished up the encyclopedia by 1997. So I was working on some other book, which I don't remember off the top of my head. And my point is, <laughs> you're, you're a mature adult at this point in your life, and you had never experienced anything, but you've been collecting all this data. You're writing and you're researching and you're authoring books and publishing. And then suddenly this happens. Did it just cause you to just take a step back and go, well, you know what? Maybe some of these people aren't as crazy as, <laughs> as I thought well, they were. But what I took away from it was that there's this enormous socialization against believing anything weird can happen. Exactly. And even though I know intellectually that weird stuff happens and it happens all the time, I could not accept that it could happen to me. That if something happened to me, I could explain it. And that was such a strange and unexpected reaction on my part that it still causes me wonder. Well, and and 
the the witness testimony, people coming to you, like your friend from Waukegan, for instance, mm-hmm. where where you know they're coming to you and they're telling you this uh, fantastical story or tale, uh, truth or not, but they still have the courage to come to you and talk. Now you have to go to somebody and possibly tell this story too. Did you feel empathy for the witnesses of the past? Because now you are put in that position of oh. having to tell the fantastic story. Oh, I don't care if people think I'm crazy. That's not <laughs> at this stage of my life. <laughs> oh, how did you deal with it? How did you, did, were you comfortable? Well, you, how many times have you told this story, by the way? Well, I wrote about it, actually, the uh, Journal of Scientific Exploration, which is published by the Society for Scientific Exploration, asked me to one time to write an autobiographical essay about, which I wrote several years ago. It's called Among the Anomalies, and it's about my life, studying weird stuff and being around that. And the whole thing starts with a, with a detailed account of the story I just told you. Hey, are you comfortable in telling the story now? Oh, absolutely. I mean... You know, anybody who thinks that I'm lying or I'm crazy, well, how can I prove I'm not? It was just a classic experience anomaly. Well, I've had, uh, we're up against, uh, well, I, we've got five minutes. And so I'm, I'm going to tell this one story. And I don't tell it often. And the reason why, uh, I've only told it maybe five, ten times in my life. And the only reason why is because it's fantastic. It's fantastic. And I don't want people to think anything crazy about me because I'm a black and white logical guy. I'm open-minded, but I just, uh, that's the way I run, uh, run my life. But this is, this is the story. And I'll give you the very, very abridged version. Um, uh, this was here in Southern California and I was pulling up to a friend's house where I was meeting, uh, a couple of people, um, after, uh, uh, a, a trip to a restaurant here in the valley. It's, it's, let's just cut to the chase. It's about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. They are leaving the restaurant. They're in another car. I'm in my car. We're going to meet at their place in in about a half hour, uh, driving from the valley to Hollywood. I get to the house first, and I pull through the driveway. I pull up to the to the house, and it's it's a nice little white house with a big front porch with a big picture window in the, in the front and, and it's, it's about two o'clock in the morning, full moon. And I pull up and, and there's no cars in the driveway. So I know that I'm first. So I'm just sitting in my car and I look over at the front porch, which is about maybe 20, 25 feet to my left. Um, and I look and I see the curtain pull open. It's right in front of me. And a face looks out at my car. And I thought, oh, somebody's here. Oh, okay. And that happened after about five minutes. So I get out of my car and I go up to the front porch and I'm waiting for the door to open, you know, because they know that I'm there. They can hear me. There's nothing. And I knock on the door. I I, I can't look through the window anymore because now the curtain's closed. And I thought, man, why are they playing with me? You know, I'm knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door. I go back to my car. After this, this is this is like ten minutes. I'm waiting on the front porch, and and I don't know who it is, but I I know that somebody's there. But maybe they're getting dressed. Maybe they're doing this stuff before they can come and open up. I go back to my car, frustrated. I sit in the front seat and I just stare at that front window. And it happens again about a half hour later. The the, the curtain moves about a foot. I go back, and I'm a little bit angry. I don't get an answer at the door. I go back, and I wait in my car. About a half hour later, the the people show up, uh, my friends. They get out of the car, and I'm like, man, you know, I forget the roommate's name. She's in there, but she's not answering the door. No, she's not. She's behind us, and then her car pulls up. Now all three cars are there, and I tell everybody what's going. We go, we unlock the house, go in, dark, empty, nobody there. And I'm just saying, I saw when I was so angry, and then I was really scratching my head. And all I can say is, I know what I saw. I know what I experienced, but I've got no proof. 
There's nothing I could do or say to convince anybody. And, and I was almost feeling a little bit foolish. And then I started to think, could I have imagined it twice, the same experience? But that's, that's, that's what happened to me. And, and uh, again, uh, you know, experience anomaly. Can't prove right. it. It, it, it. As with my experience, it, it exists in memory and testimony and nowhere else. But, you know, it happened to you, but you can't do anything with it. It's very frustrating. And like I said, I keep my cards close to my chest now. I just don't want people to look at me like, you know, and but I can only say that uh, what happened to me happened. Let's take a break. Can I can I get 15 more minutes from you? Sure. OK, just stay with us. Let's t- take take a quick two minutes and we'll be back right after this. This is KJCR. We are with Jerome Clark telling some stories. This is this is a wonderful time. Fade to Black, Dark Matter Radio Network. We'll be back right after this. Don't touch that mouse. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. matter. You're listening to Fade to Black. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzonel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. KJCR, JimmyChurchRadio.com, ArtBell.com, Dark Matter Radio Network.net. <laughs> All right. Shoot me an email to Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Follow us on Twitter at JChurchRadio, YouTube. Everything's got Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Something is in it. You can find it. Go like, subscribe, friend do it all okay i appreciate everybody coming in tonight very special show tonight with jerome clark and uh now jerome are you with us by the way yep okay good uh and thanks for hanging on uh and giving us another segment here but i i can't let you get away with um uh i have an opportunity here to ask you some some things that I just need to, I just need to ask out of everything. And you've documented every single, well, going through the early nineties, um, UFO cases there, there obviously are a couple that stand out for you, uh, in a black and white sense. Um, and for you, uh, give me one or two of the cases, you know, leaving Roswell aside and, and yeah, some I don't the think other, Roswell's a really a strong case. Yeah, it, right? exactly. So at leaving that, but for you, um, surprise me with something. Teach me something. Oh, I don't know that I have anything brilliant to say. I mean, it, it all depends on, you know, what you consider an interesting UFO case. There, I think that the high strangeness cases are always, you know, extraordinarily in, in, intriguing and 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 scary and stuff and but again they they don't go anywhere they, in in their end they're just stories even you know when told by sincere people cuz they're just they're there in memory and testimony nowhere else the 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 hardcore cases as i said before that where if you're going to make a case for extraterrestrial visitation this is where you go and this is actually where the ufo controversy will be solved. It's the cases that that science can deal with, like the RB-47 case, which is a case of, you know, an RB-47 aircraft over a period of several hours over several states in the South, 
monitoring a UFO with the state of the art, you know, electro ECM, electro intelligence uh, my, module. My, my brain's yes. getting a little foggy here, <laughs> but um, and also while the UFO was being observed visually and also tracked by at least two radar screens on the ground. Now this is a case that that is it's a complex case with many technical details which I could not recite off the top of my head but which comprises 40 pages of the second edition of the UFO Encyclopedia and this case was extensively investigated by first by Project Blue Book and later by the atmospheric physicist James McDonald and in later years and then also by the Condon Committee, which was formed in the late 1960s at the University of Colorado in contract with Project Blue Book. The, the Condon Committee investigated this case, and then in the later years was reinvestigated by an aerospace engineer named Brad Sparks. And Sparks wrote a 40-page entry in my UFO encyclopedia that goes into this case, which he spent years investigating and documenting. And Brad, who's not prone to overstatement, says that this is the one case that proves the existence of UFOs as you know some something technological and somebody else's technology. Now, the most impressive cases are not the most colorful; they're often quite technical, such as uh, well, for example, the the trans the trans on Provence. CE2, Close Encounter the Second Kind, which happened in France mm-hmm, mm-hmm. some years ago in 1981, that where the French police took samples from a UFO landing site and got them to, you know, a government laboratory, and they were studied in the laboratory and found to, to be very interesting and and uh, explainable only by the interaction of the environment and some somebody else's technology. These are the cases that. You know, that to me, and I think that to probably to most open-minded observers would say, comprise the hard evidence, and the hard evidence suggests that somebody else's technology is here in our atmosphere and occasionally leaving physical evidence of its presence. Well, for me, I, uh, I've i got a list of things that I'm slowly checking off here and doing this show, and and one of those cases, and you're you're exactly right, is um, is Bob Salas's uh, experience with Malmstrom Air Force Base, and um, I'm assuming I don't know. This is uh, I can't exactly uh, recall, but did you did did that get included in in uh, the encyclopedia, the UFO book? No, I didn't. No, I didn't really know about it at the time. I would have written about it if I if I had known about it. But I think it came to light later. Okay, that's so. I I I interviewed Bob uh, oh, last month, and uh, it's a case where and uh, you talked about this earlier, but it's it, it, the truth is always in the details. You know, it's it's in the details. You know, if you're going to do, like you were saying, with channeling and you're going to channel and, and everything seems to be in broad terms and, you, you know, nothing definitive. But in in a case like with uh, Captain Salas, that it, it's a black and white, obvious thing where there are uh, documents there. And that's that. And then moving on to like uh, Travis Walton, who uh, who I interviewed last week again. Uh, witnesses and 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 the police and the detective you know there's things involved in this case other than an experience anomaly right. and, and right. you know and I just stop it with with cases like that and I um, those are the people that I need to have on this show to answer questions for me because an experience anomaly is one thing that is and it it is uh, uh, we had Stan Romanek on uh, last week. And, uh, you know, uh, an extreme case of experience anomaly. Um, but uh, it's those cases for me that uh, where you've got the black and white stuff that backs right. up the case. Yeah, th- these are the event anomalies. Yes. Yeah. And these happened in this 
world outside somebody's head or outside some kind of fuzzy realm that's not quite real, not quite unreal. Now, these happened in the sense that we ordinarily use the verb happened. With um, uh, and again, we're we're up against. Uh, I, I just want to get as much in with you before you have to de- depart. What's uh, give me one case uh, uh, where um, I understand the RB forty nine, but um, and we just touched upon that. But what's the one thing where you would, if you were trying to convince? somebody uh, a friend of yours a family member where you just had to stomp your hand down on the t- table and go no no this okay but th- check this out what's the one case that that uh you feel strongest about well i think that it, that again it's rb47 case or the coin helicopter case from october 1973 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know where you have an extraordinary interaction of a helicopter crew and a UFO that causes, you know, the the uh, craft, the, the helicopter to descend some like 1,200 feet. This is witnessed by separate independent witnesses on the ground. And, um, you know, it's cases like that that just, you know, just are uncrackable. Of course, you know, people try to crack them, and that's the inevitable part of the whole kind of dynamic. But nobody's ever come up with a persuasive counter explanation than that there was some kind of extraordinary interaction between witnesses and earthly technology and somebody else's technology. What do you think it's going to, what is it going to take for uh, disclosure? Tomorrow night I have Stephen Bassett on. And uh, somebody I respect a lot, and he's a courageous guy, and sometimes I think he's out there all alone. We need more people like Stephen to face up to the uh, the big bear that is our government. But uh, what do you think it's going to take? What, what What is the event that's going to happen? They always talk about the, the, you know, the flying saucer in the White House lawn. You know, uh, but short of that, what is it that it's going to take? You have presented and published so much. And even that is not enough. Do, uh, what is it? Uh, what do you think is is going to push uh, the government over the edge for any type of disclosure? Well, I don't know that the government has anything to disclose. But in terms of just solving this thing, and science pays attention to it and resolves the issues, and science can solve this, I think that I'm trying to compress this into a very simple thing because this is something I've thought a lot about. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to happen the next generation or two. It's going to happen as we hear, we discover more and more old extrasolar planets, as it becomes clear that Earth-like planets are staggeringly abundant in our galaxy, hundreds of millions and more Mm -hmm. of Earth-like planets. If that's true, the galaxy is almost certainly teeming with intelligent civilizations. It beggars belief that if that's true, that we're not going to see direct evidence of that in our space because some of these civilizations will be traveling through the galaxy, either you know with manned vehicles or robot vehicles. We're going to see evidence because they will be able to know through their instruments that the Earth harbors life. You know, through this spectroscopic analysis will show them that there are all the elements of biology and life on earth and so they wouldn't discover us accidentally they would come here because they knew we were here that is the subject actually of growing quiet speculation among astronomers who are thinking about extraterrestrial life well we're certainly doing that exact that's exactly what we're doing now right you know also the complete failure of the SETI program which began in the late 1950s, has gotten nowhere. And the, the, the obvious re- realization that the scientists who insist that there's abundant life in the galaxy are going to have to prove it. They're not going to be able to prove it through SETI. And they're going to have to look around elsewhere. And as some of them will privately admit, it may be time to look at the most puzzling UFO reports for that evidence. With with SETI, this this is where I'm 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 a little bit di- divided. If we don't, 
if we don't do it, I don't think that is good. If, you know, if, if we, because then we know absolutely nothing. Although SETI hasn't been able to uh, provide us with anything, um, but if we don't do it, do you think that's right too as well? I think we need to. I think we need to listen. I mean, you, you, you. you <laughs> I don't there, there, there's a there's a book that came out recently that I recommend to anybody who's wrestling with these questions. It's by a British science journalist named Edward Ashpole, who's a perfectly respectable guy not a ufologist, not a weirdo, who writes that, yes, set in his book, Signatures of Life, that, yes, SETI has failed, and, it's, there's, and it was probably fundamentally misconceived, but what it did was force us to think about extraterrestrial life, what the evidence for it is, what it might be like, and it generated an enormous amount of interesting writing, intelligent writing, about the nature of of potential extraterrestrial civilizations. And Ashful points out that by the, but if you study all the implications that came out of the SETI concept, all the ideas that astronomers have kicked around about hypothetical ETs, it all comes down to exactly what the UFO phenomenon that people are reporting is. But what do you consider uh, a failure with SETI? What what are well, you? Well, no, no, nobody's responding, and probably nobody could respond because the whole thing was just misconceived. That 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 it's unlikely that there are civilizations out there doing what we're doing and sending you know radio beams out there, and also of course radio beams are traveling at the speed of light. It's an enormously complicated and hopeless way of communicating. But he says that SETI posited that the galaxy is, is populated, probably densely populated, that there are intelligent civilizations out there that are older, sometimes by millions of years, than ours, that, that are out there. And uh, anyway, he just develops this really impressive argument showing how the speculation that came out of SETI work applies to observational data about UFO sightings. Well, the UFOs appear to be acting in a way that we would think extraterrestrials would. If we, and, and my argument is this, and it's not really an argument, it's a say, but if, if we didn't do it, if we didn't try, then certainly the, then we, we don't have any. I'd rather try and come up empty than have the question out there that we you know what you know we should have been trying this whole time how do how do we not how do we not try and that's just my view but no i think that's a reasonable thing to say and i don't particularly disagree with you about that i just wish that some money had been spent doing scientific research on ufo reports yeah that's well that that's an obvious i still to this day i thought this is where when I was a kid, now you've got just a couple of years on me, okay? But let's go back to 1969, you know, 1970-ish. And I'm reading and and I find out about Heineck and Project Blue Book and I'm all excited. And uh, uh, there were TV shows that were coming out at that time. It was just a, it was a great time, that, you know, Apollo. And it was just a great time to 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 learn about space every kid wanted to be an astronaut if you right. know what i mean yep. so and i feel like looking back now that project blue book it was I, I i was completely lied to as a kid i thought that there was all of this scientific study going into this and i remember as a kid reading about swamp gas as you know and i i <laughs> I'm still waiting, by the way, Jerry, to see my first swamp gas. I don't know if you've. Uh, <laughs> I don't well, know if you particularly in March in the Upper Midwest, yeah. <laughs> when it doesn't exist. Which but, is, but and that sighting that was attributed to swamp gas occurred. Yeah, well, or is it? Uh, wasn't it in Michigan? Uh, I think in Michigan. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, I I thought that there was all of the scientific research going in to uh the ufo phenomena and it turns out there was nothing no no zero I, zilch I, I i was friends with alan Hynek, who was 
the scientific guy, the astronomer with Project Blue Book for most of Project Blue Book's history. And he always complained in, in, in his book, The UFO Experience, and also personally, we talk about it all the time, about how the lack of scientific expertise applied to UFO reports and how Blue Book was basically a joke. Did, um, he's not around for me to speak to today, So, but you were friends with him, and I'm, I'm glad I can ask you this question. Did he feel, did he express to you that his hands were tied, that he was being held back? I, he thought he thought that he was mostly. I mean, Alan was a very nice man. I want to say so I don't want him. I don't want him to sound like an arrogant jerk when I say this because he wasn't. Okay. But he felt that he was just surrounded by, let's put it kindly, guys who were up to the job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> and he would shake his head when he would talk about some of these characters, who you know these. Air Force officers who and, and enlisted men who were in Blue Book who really didn't know much about anything and were just basically time servers shuffling paper. Right. And did he, um, did he, was he a, a skeptic in the beginning of Project Blue Book? Yeah, he was, he was the guy they called in when they wanted to explain cases from an astronomical point of view. Well, I understand. Uh, I uh, I don't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. No, but, go ahead. Um, I I what I mean is, did he uh, was he a skeptic? Skeptic though, did he not believe uh, uh, the UFO hypothesis? Did 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 he not the the ETH? Did he not believe in that? I know he was told <laughs> to say something, but because I th is, is it true that he eventually changed his mind? That's what I'm well, getting. Well, yes, he did change his mind in, in, a, in a very public way in the mid-1960s, but he, was, he started with the Air Force project. The original project was Project Sign, and then it became Project Grudge in the late 40s, and he was assigned very early on in the late 40s to be the scientific consultant. So he knew just about all these guys who went through the Air Force projects personally. And they didn't have to tell him to explain the case. It was just understood that they that UFOs were a nuisance, public interest was a nuisance, and they just wanted to discourage people from bothering the Air Force about it. So he didn't have to be told, but also the Air well, this is a complicated story. I can't just tell it in a minute about what Alan Hynek went through. Suffice it to say that he was periodically intrigued and curious, but he was basically a skeptic until he finally, the force of evidence and the pressure by some of his colleagues who really knew what was going on, forced him to go, to go public with an acknowledgement that something was going on. And by that time, he and Blue Book were pretty much estranged. Right. Did he ever confide anything in you that you could tell me <laughs> publicly? It's nobody's listening. This is just between you and I, Jerry. No, I can tell you honestly that 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 Alan wasn't. You know, he, Alan actually had a high security clearance. I mean, he was. You know, because he did other work for the government besides UFOs, and um, like many scientists of his generation, there was nothing special about that. But no, I don't think that Alan. Uh, was in on any secrets and we, we, you know we often talked about you know what the government did or didn't know and he never really saw any evidence that they were that the air force or the cia or whoever we, you know had the answer and was 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 holding on to it he never saw any evidence of that he just saw evidence of just complete incompetence right right and, so and, there was no there was no that's almost worse than knowing the <laughs> exactly. truth exactly <laughs> <laughs> so there was no hidden meaning in his appearance in uh, Close Encounters. Oh. <laughs> no, you know, there. You know, I hear conspiracy theories and uh, about Alan, and I, yeah, they're just a waste of time. <laughs> Alan was a pretty straightforward guy. Um, and like I said, I, I really thought. Um, uh, back to your point, I really thought uh, when I was uh, a kid, reading as much as I could in the late sixties and seventies, and uh, you know, you had Betty and Barney Hill, and 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 all of these events that just seemed like they were happening all the time. 
and of course with the you know the moon and and apollo it was it was something that was inevitable that it was all true and we were interested in it scientifically and and as well as uh as a uh, uh, community and our you know it just seemed like it was inevitable and then i find out as an adult looking back that it wasn't taken serious at all and yeah. and, and and you're right there was a, a, an enormous amount of funds that were spent in other areas that could have gone to serious scientific research and it just never happened yeah i i am absolutely convinced that the ufo phenomenon is solvable just by ordinary science but you just have to have the research you have to have the scientists you have to have the money that finances investigations and laboratory analysis and you can solve it you know there's enough evidence there the scientists have stuff to work with they have evidence to work with it it should have been solved long ago and will be solved but i don't expect that I will be around when that happens, but I don't think it will. That, it, that answers await us only in the distant future. I think they're just a generation or two away. They just demand the will and the resources. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not going to let you get out of here. I asked you a question at the very, very beginning when you came on the show, and that's the beauty of just having a conversation. We went everywhere but answering the question, which was, why, why do we have these four generations of uh, types of craft? Why, you know, flying saucers to, to, to uh, uh, cigar-shaped, uh, the, the black triangles. Now we have these football field size thing, you know, these descriptions all the time now of, of, of you know, like the Phoenix lights, uh, uh, situation. What is it? Is it, is it perception? Is it what they see on television? Is it, it, it mind, uh, implant, uh, you know, what, no, what I, explains I, I, it? I, I think that, you know, it, it just goes back to what I've been talking about all through this conversation. And that is that there's a core of, hard evidence cases, the event anomalies. And um, then there's so much of this stuff is kind of subjective experience anomalies. And I think some of these accounts of just really, really strange encounters with strange looking craft and so on are really not event phenomena. And I think the, the confusion, the assumption that everything that people describe in a UFO context is one thing, is a fundamental error. I think we're dealing with more than one thing. We're dealing with at least two things. And we're, and we're dealing with uh, the secondary phenomenon, the experience phenomenon, the visionary phenomenon, that is like dreams that take their inspiration from the core of real reports of real this world technological vehicles. And they and so our whole idea of the otherworldly, just as at one time in the history of humanity was conceived of as a supernatural fairy race, now it's a vision of extraterrestrials. That's our idea of the otherworldly. Mm -hmm. Well, it may mm -hmm. be true that a small number of UFO reports are suggestive of extraterrestrial visitation, but the rest of this is kind of visionary phenomena, experience anomalies, extraordinary dreams of a sort that we really don't understand very well. So if you throw all this together and assume it's the same thing, you're not going to get any coherent vision of what may be happening. But if you separate these things, you can say, okay, these daylight discs show up on radar. They land and they leave strange traces on the ground. There's something there that science can work with. But when somebody says that it's weird craft took me to another planet and the person appears to be sane and sincere, I think that's a whole other order of experience. I have to thank you for coming on tonight. This is one of the best conversations <laughs> I've ever had. I hope you enjoyed yourself, too. Oh, definitely. And it's really been fun. And you've asked good questions. And as you say, it's been like a conversation. <laughs> now, your your most recent book is Unexplained. Uh, you can find that on Amazon. And I will get some links up uh, on the site uh, tonight if, they, or if they're not up there now. And uh, and we'll take care of that for you. Are you going to speak anytime soon in public? Do you have anything, any events coming up? 
No, I'm kind of a reclusive guy. I, I used to do all of that, but I just stay home with my family and my cats. And that's why I, I just have to say thank you for coming out of semi-retirement. And this, uh, for everybody out there, this meant, it means a lot to everybody. And it uh, was just a wonderful experience. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Good night. And, and good night. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Wow. JimmyChurchRadio.com. And what more can I say? That's Fade to Black. That was Jerome Clark. And I've never had a conversation like that before. That was just extraordinary. I feel a little dumb at the moment. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. We're going to take a little break. What's up? My name's Brian Taylor, Ninja Badass Extraordinaire, and this is JimmyChurchRadio.com. J-J-C-R in your face. JimmyChurchRadio.com On the Dark Matter Radio Network. Woo! Fade to black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Let's open up the phone lines, 323-825-5045. I would like to uh, get your input on that conversation. That was absolutely incredible. The phone lines are wide open, 323-825-5045. I've got a bunch of other stuff that I wanted to uh, try to get into this evening and cover, so I'm going to get into some of that, but... I just want to say what you just experienced right there with Jerome Clark. This is one of the most uh, prolific, extraordinary writers. And if you haven't in, in our generation, and if you haven't experienced any of it, you've got to go and read. He uh, was somebody that I had to seek out. And uh, he so graciously agreed to come on and spend some time with us tonight. But that was... That was an, e an event, and you just heard him say it himself. It's something that he just doesn't do. And in talking to him and, and uh, uh, with, uh, with our conversations throughout the week, he couldn't wait to come on the show, and he was excited about it. He just doesn't do it often, and that was uh, extraordinary, to say the least. And for him to – and I want to – I want to summarize a little bit about a, a, a couple of points that he made. Now, uh, earlier uh, this week, he sent me a couple of uh, papers. And so I went through and I read them. And, <clears throat> and we, that's basically what this conversation was about tonight, the anomaly, the experience anomaly, and what the difference between the two of them are. By the way, shoot me an email to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. I've got a a big chunk of uh, email in front of me. Uh, send me some more, jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. If I can get to them, uh, I will. But I want the emails to come in in real time in response to what I'm talking about, okay, and what you just experienced. Also over, and I can see that uh, there's been some posting going on in the forums. I'm looking at that now too as well. And please get over to the form. I will respond in the forum after the show tonight. I will get as much of that done as I can. That is uh, jimmychurchradio.com. Go to the forum, social forums page. Okay? Now, uh, so anyway, there's two different anomalies that he's referring to. And uh, by the way, I'm watching the emails come in, anomaly, anomaly, anomaly. There's two. There's the event anomaly, which is something that can be backed up with some type of fact, a second witness, a photograph, radar, um, film, video. There's, there's that aspect of it where it's backed up by some – it's an event that actually happened, trace evidence, physical stuff. And then there is the experience anomaly, which is something that you can't back up. It's just your experience. You have no proof. And 
uh, you heard me tell the story earlier about my little experience anomaly. This paper today, uh, or the the, the uh, paper that I had read, uh, explains uh, the experience anomaly that has gone back throughout history and how it can tie in and does tie in all the way up to today, where the experience anomaly in in uh, in folklore with uh, fairies and, and gnomes and other types of things that could never be proven. Uh, there's that, and but it goes all the way through the airship phenomena that happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, the report started, as, as you had heard him say today, and I've read a lot about, 1870, 1880, a couple of sporadic things are, are surfacing with these airships going through the 1900s, uh, 1901, 03. Um, but there wasn't any proof. Witnesses came forward ex- uh, telling their story, but there wasn't actually any proof of anything that had happened. That is an experience anomaly that goes all the way up through today. And when you have somebody that says uh, something happened to them, but they can't prove it doesn't necessarily mean that it didn't happen. And there is something to the UFO experience an ET experience, uh, a close encounter experience that can't be proven. That is very similar to stories that have been going on for hundreds of years. It's a very, when I said earlier, this was something where just a light went off in my head where it's like, you know, it just, it just makes an awful lot of sense. And if you think about it in those terms, it answers a lot of questions. And one day we will be able to prove the experience anomaly. And, and I, I firmly believe that. And there's, there's got to be some type of truth, some interdimensional parallel thing that answers a lot of questions, not only with UFO sightings and video and, and photographs and the event anomaly, but uh, also with the uh, uh, experience anomaly. And if you look at it in those terms, it does make a lot of sense. And having him come in and explain it, I could not wait to have him come in and just make sense of it for me because it, uh, it, 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 it was easy for me to read today, but I needed somebody to explain it. And I hope everybody out there learned something today. All right. Again, the phone lines are open. I'm going to take a break. Get, uh, get in on the phones. Get in. They are open right now. 323-825-5045. When I come back, I'll be taking your calls. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'll be back in a couple seconds. Stay with us. And I listen to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Jimmy Church. Church. My name is Alan, and I listen to JimmyChurchRadio.com. He's always giving it to you straight. JimmyChurchRadio.com. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey. And you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio, the The Revolution. All right. KJCR, fade to black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. We are live from Burbank, California. 90 degrees here today. Absolutely roasting. It's hot right now. All right. Shoot me an email to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Go follow us on Twitter at jchurchradio. Get over to YouTube. Subscribe. All of these shows are archived there. I think we even have it at jimmychurchradio.com. 
uh, and do participate in those social forums. And I'm really excited about the addition of that. And uh, uh, the participation to me is one of the best forms of freedom of speech. And that's what this show is all about. I want to read a couple of emails here. Oh, I, I just wanted to say this. Uh, when you have on a guy like Jerome Clark, where we are able to freely exchange uh, ideas in a conversation like that, that is something that you just don't get. It's kind of like, you know, Charlie Rose. You know, love Charlie Rose. But if you think about the way that he approaches things, you just don't get that too often anywhere, if, if not at all. And having that kind of conversation today freely back and forth, you just don't get out of radio anywhere. And that is why I do this show. I need to, you know, one of the things when I'm going to go on the way back machine for a second, but when I decided to get into radio, it was because I just wasn't getting what I needed from from the programming i would get i would get like half and it was something that i just thought if i ever get back you know i'm going to go back to school i want to i want to get into this and i want to uh give i i wanted to have a a program that allowed myself to give 100% where i knew that deep down inside I wasn't holding back for anybody. And then that would that that's the little piece that I was missing. If I could just find a way to give that back. And that conversation we just had with Jerome Clark, not only that, all of our guests, but that's a classic example of not holding back. And he knew that he didn't have to hold back. He was able to just just talk freely and open up that frontal lobe of his brain and get that connected to his mouth and his and be able to just talk and it comes across and i hope that you enjoyed exactly uh how i felt that it comes across because that is important to me shoot me an email tell me tweet just let me know that we're on target that you're you understand what i am trying to say right now it is very important to have that kind of open lines of communication. All right, I want to read a couple of emails. Uh, and by the way, uh, got some phone calls coming in. 323-825-5045. And if you're not writing it down, get over to the website. Get over to jimmychurchradio.com. The phone number's right there. You can also Skype. We have a Skype line, too, as well, which is Fade to Black 14. I love the way that Skype sounds, by the way. And if you have a really good microphone, on your computer or a headset, Skype. Skype is wonderful. Skype sounds like me right now. It sounds like you're right in here. Okay, a couple of emails really quick. Hi. Oh, this is titled Experiencer Anomaly. I've got phone lines going off here. Hi. I was driving home from Vegas. And we were in the mountains of Wyoming, and my buddy went to sleep in the back of the Winnebago. And it was 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, and I suddenly became very drowsy. So I was going to wake my buddy and let him drive. Jimmy, the, next, the very next thing I remember, I awoke completely rested, and I was driving the vehicle with my hand on the wheel and at first, I didn't know where I was. Then soon, I saw the sun breaking over the horizon, causing dawn, and I saw a sign on the interstate, and it said I was about an hour from Denver, Colorado, and was exactly where I should be. My buddy awoke, and he said I did a great job, and that he slapped me on, then he slapped me on the shoulder and said, Wow, you never even stopped, and I and didn't use any gas. I was at a total loss to explain this experience, and my buddy drove home to the southeast Nebraska, and I was wide awake for the next 10 hours home. Yes, it's all true. What a strange experience, and how can anybody explain it? And that's exactly what an experience anomaly is. I, uh, I, had, a, I had a friend. You know what? I, I can say his first name. His name is Dell. 
And uh, when we were, this is about 20 years ago, and I was over at his house or at his brother's house. And uh, the a uh, couple of families got together, his his side of the family and my friends. I, we, we had about 10 or 20 people over at the house. And his brother tells us this story. Older gentleman. I mean, I was probably 22, 23 years old at the time. And I'm going to say his brother was in his early 40s. Tells us this story. And this is an experience anomaly. He says that they were... He was driving down uh, the Angeles Crest Freeway, which uh, for everybody to understand, the Angeles Crest Highway Freeway is a winding road that goes up through the mountains here in California that connect the San Fernando, San Gabriel Valley all the way to the other side to the Mojave Desert. So if you take... That freeway, and I have no idea how many miles it is, but it's got to be 50, 100 miles um, the way it winds through the mountains, goes up over Mount Waterman uh, to the other side, ends up in the Mojave Desert on the far side. But it is a winding, winding road that you see in all of the TV commercials when you see a car winding down a beautiful highway. It always tends to be uh, the Angeles Crest Highway, very beautiful winding road. Um, some of it can be very secluded. Some of it, there's a lot of traffic on. A lot of motorcycles go up there and race and, and do stuff. Well, anyway, he's up on the Angeles Crest Highway. And he sees up ahead uh, a, little, a little person in a silver suit with a helmet on, space helmet, running across the the road and he pulls his car over and I, uh, he sees another one run across the road and, uh, down the mountainside, he pulls the car over, gets out of his car and, uh, takes chase, runs into the woods and he can see them up in front of him. And they're very short. They're, they're two feet tall. Not three feet, not four. Very, very, very short. But they did have some type of suit on, uh, like a space suit. Not a tight fitting, not this, but it was like a suit suit. Uh, breathing apparatus, helmet, the whole shot. But they were very, very short, two feet tall. But they're booking and they are running through the woods, the two of them. And he's chasing them, going deeper and deeper and deeper into the woods and cannot catch them. He can see them. He can make out details. They're not that far ahead, but what he can't do is catch them. They're always staying a little bit in front of him. Oh, by the way, this is like 12 noon. It's in the middle of the day. And eventually he tires out and gives up the chase. And uh, he chased them for 30 minutes into the woods. And he turns around, and he's got to hike all the way back to the car. Now, he tells me this story. That's an experience anomaly in that he's got no witness, got no proof, got no cameras, and it's an extraordinary story, and you can't explain it away. What do you do with that? And for him, he was so matter-of-fact and the, the detail and the level of the detail of everything that he uh, hit me with in this story kept me. I was breathless. I was just sitting there. You've got to be joking, really. Now, I want to guess and say this was 1980, 85 when he told me the story. So this is almost 30 years ago now. But it left a mark with me, and to this day, I have not forgotten that story. I've got to get a hold. I, I will get his brother on the air and have him tell this story. I would love for him to tell the story again. It was one of those things that took me down the road of ufology. And uh, we, um, I've got a couple other things I need to talk about and get to here. But um, I, uh, he... He took me into his office and showed me a bunch of uh, books, and he had some videotape, too, as well, um, on the subject of UFOs. And he was one of the guys that took me down that, that path originally. But 
he he had this event that happened to him and it affected him so much that he went out and got every single thing that he could every book and ever i mean he had a stack of billy meyer he had a stack of this and these uh, these videos and it changed his life but he had told me then that it was something that you know he was uncomfortable talking uh, and telling his story to people because nobody believed him and and if i remember right this guy was a, an electrical engineer and lived in a nice place down in uh, El Toro, down in, in in Southern California, nice area, and just a normal guy by all accounts. But he had his life changed, and in an indirect way. And he doesn't he doesn't know it now, but it changed my life too as well. Listening to him tell this story, and I believed everything that he said. There was no reason. For him to make any of this up, a couple of creatures run across the Angeles Crest Highway. He see, pulls over his car, and he's got to go and investigate, see what it was. You know, it's a it's a crazy story, and it's not like a story that you've heard in a movie. It's not it sounds like he was influenced by anything. It was a singular thing. I'd never heard anything like it, and it changed his life. And in a weird way, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? It changed mine. But uh, that is an experience anomaly. So. We're going to get some stuff posted up uh, uh, on the social forum, uh, Experience Anomalies. I do want to hear everybody's story yeah, and, and, and post it. I will respond. I want to know. I do. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to take another break. Now, I do uh, have a couple of things that I've got to talk about that are, uh, uh, that are in the news. And we will get to that stuff when I come back after the break. But I want to talk about. Bitcoin. And if you haven't heard about Bitcoin, we're going to have a little Bitcoin conversation when we come back. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Dark Matter Radio Network. We'll be back right after this. 323-825-5045 when I come back. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will, on the Dark Matter Radio Network. He's always giving it to you straight. JimmyChurchRadio.com On the Dark Matter Radio Network. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network. All right, everybody, welcome back. KJCR, this is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. On the Dark Matter Radio Network, sitting in for Art Bell. That's right. While we're waiting for Art's return, you know, it just makes you wonder. I hope Art is listening right now, dude. What is going on, man? When are you coming back? I get asked all day long, email, phone calls. When is he coming back? And I, you know, I'm starting to take it personal. <laughs> yeah. All right. Shoot me an email to Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. i got a bunch of stuff that has come in. I'm going to try to get to it, but uh, we only have a little bit of time left, and I needed to get in a conversation about Bitcoin. And if you're not familiar with what Bitcoin is, uh, you well, first off, sit down, get your drink, and and listen to this. Bitcoin is uh, is a new commodity. It's a new uh, uh, payment uh, method. It's decentralized uh, for electronic uh, payment. Now, Bitcoin. Okay, it's it's Bitcoin 
is a way to pay for stuff and possibly, well, the, the transactions are, and this is where I'm just going to start spitting out some of the facts. Um, it's, uh, it's something that can't be refunded. Okay. It, it can't be, it can't be counterfeited apparently, which that's, well, I'm going to talk about that in a second. And it exists on your computer. It doesn't exist in your pocket. And if you've ever had, now let's say you've got a Bitcoin and what's the value of it? We'll get to that in a second. Today it's $818, one Bitcoin. Talk about that in a minute as well. Bitcoin exists on your computer. And if you've ever had a hard drive go down and your information is lost, then that is the same thing. If you have Bitcoin or Bitcoins on your computer, computer goes down, crashes, gone, burn, whatever, then you lose your Bitcoins. And so before you say to yourself, well, that's not right. You should be able to back it up. You should have it on a, you should have it somewhere. No, if you have cash in your wallet, you're walking around and you've got, 10 $100 bills in your wallet and you lose your wallet, you lose that cash. It's the same thing. I find it disturbing that it can only exist on a computer. So, but if your wallet gets stolen, you lose it, it burns up in a fire and the cash is in there or in your license, or but you lose it. It's gone. So in those terms, as, as intrinsic as a Bitcoin seems, because it's not like change in your pocket and it's not like dollar bills and it's certainly not even like a credit card. It's not. It exists as ones and zeros on your hard drive. So you can't touch a Bitcoin. You can see it on your computer screen. You know that you've got it if it's on your hard drive. And you can account for it, but that's where it lives. That's a Bitcoin. What is the value of a Bitcoin? There's, there's, um, and I, as much as research as I have done on this over the last month, because I am fascinated with this. Um, apparently there's, uh, bitcoins have already been manufactured. That's it. And there aren't going to be any more. Please send me an email and answer if there's any more information about that, that I need to know. But apparently, and I forget the number, it doesn't matter 21 million or, or whatever. There's only so many bitcoins out there is, uh, the, the value of a bitcoin today. I looked it up before the show. I wanted to get accurate is eight. $818.41. One Bitcoin. Okay? It's not like one Bitcoin is worth $1. Now, you heard the story, and if not, of uh, uh, Silk, Silk, uh, uh, Silk Road, which was a website where you could apparently go, and not apparently, you could, uh, <laughs> go and find, find a, a hired killer for your, uh, you know, your ex-wife, uh, you could, uh, purchase drugs. You could purchase guns. You could do whatever you needed to do. Uh, that is uh, normally ill. Not to say that there's probably legal transactions there too, as well, other goods and services, but all the, the really hard to find stuff that you just can't get at Walmart like, uh, you know, silencers for your uh, nine millimeter. You could go and purchase with Bitcoins on uh, the web. And the, the, the urban myth right now that is out there uh, about Bitcoin is it's untraceable and, well, you know, the feds, uh, you know, it's all discreet and you can do these transactions. You can go buy your heroin or you can go buy your... Your, your guns or your murder for hire and use bitcoins for these transactions. Well, the feds uh, certainly prove that theory, that urban legend as incorrect when they shut down uh, the website and arrested the, 
the owner of the website, but he did he did get away with it for a few years. There's there's no doubt about that. But this is what it wasn't that part of the story that I found fascinating. It was the bitcoins and his net worth and how much this was. I was like, man, they they caught him with how many bitcoins and how much is it worth? What what did, you know? Somebody explained. I had heard about this bitcoin thing, but I just didn't think that uh it had caught on or or not not that it hadn't caught on but that 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 there was any worth to it that you could actually uh put a monetary value on it and that there was people interested in these bitcoins like this how and it existed on his laptop by the way so but the Bitcoin worth, and the reason why I'm uh, tell that story is because we're talking about this guy's worth was you know in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay, and again, um, the aspects to the story and what Bitcoins were worth on one day and what it's worth another means that his potential worth was either zero, because what is a Bitcoin worth? to a billion dollars. Bitcoins have changed directions uh, uh, minute by minute on its worth. Let me be perfectly clear. Today it's worth $818. I believe even as early as last week, it it could have been worth uh, $1,800. Two years ago, $40. A year ago, $20. $20. It's had these violent swings up in. And, and so, you know, and I know what you're uh, thinking right now, the same thoughts that I am, which is, wow, man, I should have bought Bitcoin when it was worth a buck because now it's worth $1,800. Jimmy just said it was worth $818 today. That isn't a, well, you know what? But tomorrow it could be worth nothing again. It has had these swings back and forth. I don't think you can consider a Bitcoin, um, uh, what's the word, uh, an investment, a safe investment like gold. I'm not suggesting that. But what makes it worth $1,800 or $8 or anything dollars? It is a very, very confusing, confusing technology. Now, Okay, so let me get to some more facts here. Uh, Bitcoin is pretty much like cash on the Internet. That's the best way to look at it. But it can also uh, uh, be used for bookkeeping. Um, there's, there's that aspect of it. Um, it was, uh, and, you know, some people call it cryptocurrency. Uh, I was trying to remember that term, uh, cryptocurrency. And it was first described in 1998 by uh, Wei Dai on the cyberpunk's mailing list. And he suggested that the idea of a new form of money uh, that could be used um, cryptically to control uh, transactions and, and uh, replace, you know, the Fed, uh, re- replace uh, the, the Federal Reserve or any other central currency or the euro, and get away from that, and they could have something that just um, could uh, not be counterfeited and also not controlled by central governments. Well, um, in 2009, um, Satoshi Nakamoto uh, created the actual Bitcoin concept and the proof of concept and the specification that went behind it. And um, so... It's like an open source. Um, how do I say this? Um, uh, it's 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 it can be modified. If you are if you are really good at uh, at code writing and engineering, then you can actually modify the Bitcoin yourself too as well. And uh, now this is where, for me, and I need I need everybody to wrap their head around this for a second. I would think if you have networks, DOD networks and banking networks and 
firewalls that are cracked and worms and viruses that, you know, and, and credit card information and all of that uh, cryptography that is broken, all of that just insane amount of code breaking that is, is, is eventually cracked, then why can't Bitcoins, which are not a physical thing, it's just ones and zeros, how is this not counterfeitable? How is this not duplicatable? I don't understand it. I really don't. Now, I have read over and over and over and over and seen videos and news programming on this that it is crack proof. It's counterfeit proof. And I just don't understand how it could be. I don't. Uh, they say this and I hear this over and over again, but it's not. Uh, something that I it doesn't make sense because ones and zeros on a hard drive or ones and zeros on a hard drive and a Bitcoin is nothing more than that. So how can that not be duplicated? What is a Bitcoin? Doesn't make any sense. Now, who controls who controls Bitcoin if it's not the feds? Okay, well, nobody owns the Bitcoin network. Like nobody owns email. Nobody owns the internet. You know, it's a, it's a untouchable thing. You can't physically touch. Nobody controls that. And the Bitcoin is just such a thing. Okay. Um, you can't, um, uh, you can't force, there isn't uh, a governing body behind Bitcoin. It's like an open source code. So, you nobody can how do i say nobody can regulate it but everybody can regulate it at the same time um the the protocol is open to all users and you're free to choose what software and version uh, that you use um in order to stay compatible all users uh, just need to use software complying with the same rules and and that's that's the the same idea behind email and the same idea behind the internet. It's this uh, like Linux too, as well. It's the same type of principle here. So it doesn't, for me, if everybody is involved with it and you can modify it, how can it not be counterfeited? And how can, um, uh, uh, you know, there's only so many uh, bitcoins out there that have supposedly been manufactured. Um, so, but how can it not be counterfeited? Is each one accounted for? Is there some type of, of a crypto serial number that is involved with it? So, you know, that is, it's existing on somebody's computer and that's how it's accounted for. It is very strange. Now, how does it work? Well, I had mentioned earlier, and again, I'm sounding like a brainiac. Like I know what I'm talking about. I'm just fascinated with this. And it's the, I think this is the future and this is something that we all need to know about. And I have done an awful lot of reading. It is just something that uh, I am uh, totally 100% fascinated with. And this is technology. This is today. This is what's going on. And this is important to you. Now, how does the Bitcoin work? Well, um, it's, uh, uh, there's, it's a mobile app or a computer program that provides a personal Bitcoin, and I'm using my, the quotation where, uh, marks with my fingers right now, a wallet that allows a user to send and receive Bitcoins, okay? And that's how it works for most users. You've got an electronic wallet, sits on your computer, and you've got Bitcoins going in and out of it. And when you need to buy something, uh, a Bitcoin is taken out and given to something as somebody else. Once that transaction happens, it's final. You can't return the goods like you can with a credit card going to a store or sending something back to Amazon.com or Overstock.com and the shoes didn't fit and you want the money back. It doesn't work that way. And you can't cancel a transaction either. You're in dispute with uh, uh, something or somebody. You've made a transaction and uh, the the product broke. 
uh, the, as soon as you got it home and you called the credit card company and you canceled the transaction, they won't take the, the, the product back. They said you used it. You're telling them that you didn't use it. It was broken out of the box and you're in a dispute. Well, you just cancel your credit card transaction. Well, that's, that's not the case with Bitcoin. All sales are final, and you can't get it back if you want it back. You need to trust whoever you're doing that transaction with because uh, they don't have to give it back if they don't want to. Now, if you're working with somebody that you understand or you're a friend with, you, you trust, and there's an issue that arises and they want to give you, they feel that you deserve the Bitcoin back, that's fine, but you're not taking somebody to court over a Bitcoin dispute because you're not getting it back if you don't want it back, and there's nothing you can do about it. One of the most uh, uh, the the crazy aspects of of Bitcoins, and I mentioned this earlier, is it it exists on a computer. There was a story uh, that came out two weeks ago. Three weeks ago, and I will uh, I will uh, see if I can get it and get it posted up on the website for you to check out. If you didn't hear the story, what happened was uh, a guy threw a computer away. Somehow it ended up in the local dump, and on this computer was a substantial amount of bitcoins. And if he didn't get the computer back, the Bitcoins were gone. I can't remember the exact amount, but it was a lot. A few thousand Bitcoins. And if if Bitcoin is worth $818 today, you do the math. So what did this guy do? (laughs) That's right. He went digging through the trash. He found the computer. He got his Bitcoins back. But if you lose your wallet and there's $10,000 in it, you're going to go look for that wallet everywhere until you get that wallet back. You're just not going to go, okay, well, whatever, Bitcoins are on it. Leave it in the trash. I'll never find. No, you're going to go look for it because it's the exact same thing. There is no difference. Bitcoins sit in an electronic wallet on your hard drive. That's where they exist. Lose the computer, computer crashes, hard drive goes down, computer catches on fire, house catches on fire. You don't have a backup of your Bitcoins. They exist in your software with the electronic wallet that sits on the hard drive. And that's how the Bitcoin works. It's um, <clears throat> it's 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 certainly the future. It is something that uh, I think is inevitable. But uh, the question that I have, and I would just, I need some some questions answered for me, but I just don't understand how it cannot be, how it can be so secure that the these these bold statements are out there that it's it's uncrack uncrackable. The future of money is is obvious. Okay, dollars and. And printed money is, is a waste of resources, and 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 the new hundred dollar bills are pretty cool, by the way. And I can see that those are getting close to being uncounterfeitable, but they're also they're a waste of resources, and you have to truck that stuff around and think about the wasted gas and the effort that it goes into printing and and everything. So you know, there there's an end to that. And the uh, the fact that everything could exist, your entire uh, financial history is on one card, and that that could be electronically safe. Okay, well, I, I kind of makes sense too. But then you have to look at the flip side and giving up the security of tangible dollars that you put in your pocket or you can stuff underneath your 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 mattress. There's a certain security in that. Gold too, as well. But there's a certain security in that, knowing that uh, you know your bank account isn't going to get drained one day of of all of its money because somebody hacked into. It. Well, you know what? If it sits underneath your bed and you can touch it, there's uh, a certain uh, safety and 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 sensibility for some people, which I would understand and do understand. But to give up all of that to something like a Bitcoin that 
where the dollar is worth its dollar. Okay, it can change and fluctuate slightly, but having a Bitcoin swing from a dollar or two dollar to two thousand dollars in twenty four hours, and you don't have any control over that, um, is insane to me. And it, I, I just don't. I I, I can't uh, without any regulation now. With the, uh, we're up against a break here that I'm going to take in a second. But with the, uh, with this conversation about the Bitcoin, we've got some regulation that's happening also with uh, the internet that is uh, uh, very important for all of us in our lives right now. And the freedom that we've had with not only email being free and uh, uh, the internet being. Fair to everybody. And what I mean by that is this, and this is the Bitcoin is part of this conversation, is this. When you have uh, a guy like me that uh, is on an internet radio network, as great as dark matter is and as influential as dark matter is, we have the same influence and uh, as a, a CBS or or any other terrestrial radio or anything else, we are able to uh, come on the air every night, broadcast to you, um, have advertisers, uh, do sophisticated programming and guests and everything else that everybody – but we can do this freely with the same internet speeds as anybody else out there. The access to my – website, the access to Dark Matter Radio, the access to artbell.com is the same as Amazon.com. The speeds are the same. Uh, the, the one Netflix is the one network hog out there because of the size of the files that are getting s- shipped around. But the bandwidth and the availability and the speeds of everything is equal. It's an equal playing field. But right now, you need to listen to what I am saying right now. The FCC is trying to control or trying to rein in control of the Internet and set regulations. And Congress is is going to vote on this very soon. But what the Internet providers out there, the Verizons, the AT&Ts, the Internet providers, Time Warner, they want to be able to control who gets what when it comes to Internet speed. And charge for it. Oh, you want a website that that people can view quickly? Oh, you got to pay for it. You want an edge over your competitor? You want faster download speeds? You want to be able to uh, to provide stuff to you? You want your, your website to load quickly? You got to pay for it. And what that the 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 powerful suggestion here is the thing that makes this show great is not the content on this show. That's part of it. But the fact that that this show can even exist, that's what makes it great. The ability for me to go and compete and, and for, for Keith and, and everybody else that's involved with this network to build this network is at an even playing field with anybody else that's out there. On any level, we are the same. But if if somebody wants to clamp down on this and then turn around and and charge us uh, for the ability for to compete with download speeds with somebody else, is what the, is, is the exact opposite of what the internet was was based on. The internet was was an open source where everything was free and it certainly didn't matter. And listen to what I'm saying. This didn't matter in the 1990s where every, it was slow modems and it didn't matter and w- there was no live content and streaming video and streaming audio and, and, and movies and, and, and all of that. All the networks were involved. No, that's not. So it wasn't a big deal then. Nobody cared. It took 15 minutes to download a picture and you would have to sit there and watch it refresh on your screen forever. Took you overnight to download a song, if you could find a song to download. That's not what we're talking about today. 
Now today we're talking about major competition where all of the networks are streaming content. Netflix is streaming movies. And and so when you have when you have a company like Comcast and you have Netflix and you have uh, whoever else where you have, YouTube is another example. You, now there YouTube has pay videos. So who gets the bandwidth and who gets who gets cheated? Who, who the, 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 uh, a company like Verizon or Comcast can turn around if they want to offer uh, uh, streaming audio or streaming video or have their own radio network or their own movie channels can conceivably turn around and clamp down on a company like Netflix. So it takes forever for Netflix videos to stream, but yet Verizon or Comcast has got immediately da- immediate download speeds. And that's that the freedom of the internet right now is being decided. And at the, at the end of this year, uh, potentially, uh, the FCC could could have or not have control of the internet, and it could be uh, straight down to the service providers and how they want to charge and provide service to us, and could conceivably determine how and what you hear and see things. Now, th- this isn't an editorial. Um, well, it kind of feels like that in ed- a late night editorial, but it's not that. But it's something that you need to be aware of. And uh, the the unregulated internet and email was something that we've taken for granted up until today. And it allows me to have an even playing field with everybody else. But very soon here, the internet providers are asking for that control. And if you want a faster internet, if you want something different than you're going to pay for the deluxe package. And if you if you don't care and you want slow moving this and that then then you're going to get the budget internet. Think about what I am saying. It is a crazy situation and that's where bitcoin comes in. And and bitcoin is an unregulated decentralized situation where um uh, apparently there's going to be no government control. Now, to say that uh, the government or anybody can't chase down what your uh, transactions are on the Internet, no, they can. And uh, Bitcoins will be traced. There's no doubt about that. You're not going to do anything that anonymous. But uh, all right, so for right now, I'm going to take another quick break. Uh, We are almost out of here. I'm going to take one quick break, one last segment. We come back. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Sorry for the rambling. Didn't take any calls. Why? Because I talk a lot. Fade to black. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us. This is KJCR. JimmyChurchRadio.com On the Dark Matter Radio Network Hey, it's Alan Johannes from the Vultures of Queens of the Stone Age You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com Oh God That's Doug Aldrich. Could listen to that all night. I could just let that roll till 10 o'clock and I am good. <laughs> all right. So this is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, KJCR, JimmyChurchRadio.com. Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Follow us on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Everything's over on YouTube. That is KJCR Fade to Black. 
Uh, the uh, Facebook page is jimmychurchradio.com. I believe that's the fan page. J Church, jimmychurchradio.com. Yeah, jimmychurchradio.com is the Facebook fan page. You can go and uh, like us there. It all kind of gets updated at the same time. Uh, everything kind of feeds into each other. It depends on what what uh, what you're doing first, and they kind of feed each other. But uh, if I was going to make my guess, I would say the Facebook page gets added first, which feeds into Twitter. And then if I do Twitter first, if anybody here at the station does Twitter first, that goes back to Facebook. They w- read weird and not the same. They all duplicate and stuff. So if you start anywhere, start at the Facebook page and uh, and then h- head over to Twitter. Follow us there. If you want to see any of the shows, they are all posted, most of them are posted on YouTube, and we are also updating everything on the highlights page on jimmychurchradio.com. You can go there, too, as well. So whatever you're fancy, we're trying to keep all of the bases covered. All right. Now, I've only got a few minutes left, and I wanted to talk about uh, this Iranian uh, story uh, with the <laughs> – with the, uh, that the United States has been run by a tall white alien race since uh, 1945. And prior to that, this same alien race was helping Nazi Germany. Now, before you think that I am crazy, and if you're hearing this for the first time, you can go to CNN, you can go to Forbes.com, you can go to the Washington Post and any other news outlet where you get your news from and there's there's the story right there in front of you. Um, pretty much the same information. Now, today, more information has come out. And it's this. And it's almost exactly what I was just talking about I'm talking about the control of the internet and and uh, bitcoins. Well, they're all kind of interrelated, and there's a method to my madness. But now, apparently, Edward Snowden is the culprit here. There's a there's a website that uh, that released this story originally, and it was fictitious. It was tongue in cheek. And it was a website not unlike, and I'm not going to say their name. I'm not going to give them any, any, any credit for this. Uh, because it was just, it was just a joke. It was, it, it was just uh, something that was written. But the story that came out on this particular website, and this is where it gets nutty and gets crazy, is Edward Snowden took NSA documents to Russia. And in those NSA documents, there was proof that this alien race actually existed and had been running the United States since 1945. And this disclosure in these NSA documents were that that this alien race was using the Internet to control the world and control our information. And the NSA was being run by aliens and and that's it, and that's what the Internet is doing, and it's controlling information, controlling the news, con- invading your lives, spying on everybody, and it was aliens that are doing it. That's right. Now, this chock-full-of-nuts website here in the United States uh, uh, published this story. Now, the fascinating thing uh, is that the Iranian a uh, news agency, which is called FARS, by the way, it's FARS News, F-A-R-S, um, took it at face value. And so they, now w- where I'm confused, and this is what I don't understand, and this is the beauty of the United States, and this is the beauty of freedom of speech, and this is the beauty of you being able to uh, separate fact from fiction. What is you know, the news on, on Saturday Night Live every Saturday, and they break into that. You know it's not real. But apparently somebody wants to take a chock-full-of-nuts website serious in the Middle East and, and, and print this as being fact. Now, I need you to stop and think about uh, the implications of this. The, the uh, Russian, uh, what, what the Iranians want the Iranian people to believe 
And the rest of the world, uh, by them publishing uh, this report, this news story, is that it all must be true because Edward Snowden is involved. The Russian uh, uh, Secret Service is involved. They they confirmed all of these NSA documents, and 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 it, it's 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 a fact. And if the Russians say it's true, then it's true. But they're not basing it on anything that uh, that Snowden had or anything that the Russians did. It was all from this chock full of nuts website in the United States that wrote this fictitiously. Now, what if it's all true? <laughs> you got to love this great country. This is fade to black. I am your host, Jimmy church. We are on the dark matter radio network. I want to thank Jerome Clark for coming in tonight. That was one of the coolest conversations one can ever have and that's what i'm saying that's what this web this 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 radio program the dark matter that's what we are we are on equal footing with everybody else out there and we are delivering it to you special thanks to keith Rowland. dark matter radio network show is produced by rita kamirian produced by hilton j palm announcers are Announcers are Mark Kovar. I am your host, Jimmy Church. This is Doug Aldrich. Guitars for White Snakes. Going to take us out of here. And uh, tomorrow night, don't forget, Stephen Bassett, PRG, Paradigm Research, will be in here to talk about uh, citizen disclosure and his efforts right now with, uh, with Congress and the government. I will talk to you soon. You guys have a good night. See you.